Christmas might be a fun time for others, but not for me. When it starts snowing, especially when there's a blizzard, I can't help but feel a chill run down my spine. I still remember what happened three years ago near Christmas, and I can't help but think that with my luck it could happen again. I was driving home from my Christmas shopping, my car loaded with gifts for my family and my relatives. I was especially excited about the gifts I had gotten from my wife, but I don't think that the weather wanted me home that year. A weather alert. Blizzard expected in the area. Roads will be closing immediately. All cars exit to the nearest cover. The radio crackled. I looked around and then cursed. It had been snowing, but the snow was already worsening. I knew the next exit was a couple of miles up the road, and so I figured that I'd have to pull over here and make do. I pulled over, parked my car, and sat back as the wind whistled and howled and the blizzard became worse. I must have dozed off. Suddenly, however, I heard a thumping at my car window. I opened my eyes and saw a wild old man in a Santa outfit, standing outside my car and staring at me through the window. His face was unlike anything I had ever seen. He had a massive, ugly nose with yellowish eyes. His teeth were crooked, and his outfit was wrinkled. The only redeeming quality was his magnificent beard and curly hair. I motioned for him to leave. He didn't move, however, and continued knocking. The only response he gave was a widening grin, which stretched almost unbelievably wide on his face. Hey, buddy, I, I don't want any trouble. In an instant, he disappeared. He walked backward, fading into the blizzard. I could only see a few feet from the car, and so it deemed as if he had just vanished. What the actual heck? I couldn't believe the type of psychos that were running around these days. I sighed and was about to pull out my phone when I heard a thud on the roof of my car. The thudding grew louder and I could hear his voice shouting unintelligible things. I couldn't understand him, but I knew who was on the roof of my car. Get the hell away from me! I'm calling the cops! I tried to lean in, away from the windows to the center of the car. I could still hear him dancing and thumping on the roof of my car, and it was freaking me out, pulling out my phone. I tried to call the cops. It seemed that I had no cell service in this area, however. I didn't know what to do. What happened next, however, forced me to take action. The thumping at the top of my car stopped, and in almost an instant he was back at the window. His face still had that wide grin. He began to scratch and scrape at my window with a razor. It was one of those razors that barbers would use, and it was slowly cutting through the glass. I was panicking, and without thinking, I started the ignition and tried to drive away. The snow had gotten so much worse in a matter of seconds, rendering me nearly blind. As I pressed the gas, my car began to skid and drift on the slippery roads. Suddenly, I felt my car plunge into a ditch. With a sickening thud, I hit a large boulder that was lodged into the ground, and my car's doors flew open. I could see it was dented, and I desperately tried to get it to shut. Chills ran down my spine as I realized the door had jammed open, and I saw Santa Claus in the distance walking toward me. His face was distorted to a malicious grin, and he carried a bottle of whiskey as if it were some kind of trophy. I desperately climbed out of my car, my hands shaking from the cold as I tried to run. I had barely run a few yards, however, when I slipped. The ice had been covered by the snow, and I found myself free falling onto the ground. Ho ho ho! I heard a menacing chuckle, and I turned around wildly to see the man standing directly above me, scrambling backward on my hands and knees. I tried to escape the man, but it was too late. He grabbed me by the collar of my coat and pulled me in closer. He took out a small flask and took a swig. His eyes were wild and unreadable. Merry Christmas. He whispered in my ears as he tried to force the flask into my lips. I tried to resist, but he pried my jaw open and forced me to drink. My vision went blurry, and then it went black. I woke up in a hospital a few days later, to the sight of police officers with stern faces. You might not like your body anymore, but at least you survived.
I guess that Santa wasn't just using that razor to try to get my car open. According to the officers, his actual name was Santa Claus as well. He drank too much and went on a wild rampage, assaulting people with that razor and stealing their Christmas gifts. He got to me too, and I was lucky that he didn't kill me. Christmas will always have a different feel for me now, and I guess it's true what they say. You never know what surprises the holidays can bring. This horror story was based on the true story of Santa Claus. Not the actual Santa Claus, but a man with the same legal name. He was arrested for drunk and reckless driving as well as a DUI during a blizzard. Here, you can see the mugshot of the man who was arrested, who has a beard just like that of Santa. This happened last year while I was broke and struggling to make ends meet. I had just moved out and didn't want to resort to going back to my parents. Anyways, I was incredibly desperate for a job and began searching Craigslist night and day. I don't even remember how many applications I sent to various people. After responding to several, I got a bite back from someone who had advertised themselves as a disabled man who needed help with his morning and evening routines. There wasn't much info on his illness, but what caught my attention was the pay. As a past caregiver, I thought, how hard could it be to help out a disabled man? So, I agreed to do it. He shared his address and I arrived there the next morning without failure. The man lived in an apartment. The neighborhood was quiet and the building itself appeared to be lacking maintenance. Nothing shocking to be honest. I knocked on the door and heard a voice from the other side. It's open! Please come in! Upon entering, I saw a man about the age of 50 to 55, sitting in a wheelchair. He had a bottle-shaped face and the bottom of his eyelids stretched downwards. The feeble, prickly hair on his head made him look like a homeless person. To top it off, he had these beaver teeth that made his overall appearance rather disturbing. Come closer, dear, so I can see your face. These old eyes don't work well. Hi, I'm Amy. We talked on the phone last night? I know who you are. You're not just smart, but pretty as well. I like pretty girls. I hardly get to see any these days. <laughs> now as disturbing as it may sound, I had no choice. I was already there and I needed his money. I put my jacket on the hook and asked, So, what do you want me to do first? How about we start with a bath? I haven't taken one in weeks. Oh damn, that's bad. But I knew what I was stepping into. So I grasped his wheelchair and started taking him to the bathroom. Do you live alone? I do now. My wife died three months back. She was the nicest woman. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr... Call me Daniel. Um, okay, Daniel. Once we were inside the bathroom, I saw a tub filled with dirty clogged water. The sink was so bad that I almost vomited. I'm sorry for the mess. My legs don't work anymore, which is why I'm unable to clean the apartment. Well, you should hire help for that too. Yeah, I'm just learning to use Craigslist, so maybe next time. <laughs> Isn't it amazing what you can do on the internet? I mean, you can meet anyone so easily. Yeah, please take off your t-shirt so I can start with the bath. He grinned and took off his t-shirt. It was surprising to see so much chest hair on his body. I poured the body wash on his back and started scrubbing it with the loofah. <laughs> it tickles! <laughs> it was getting extremely irritating as he spilled water and soap everywhere. Even on my clothes. Okay, we're done here. What? Really? But I was having so much fun. Your hands are so soft. I washed my hands and threw a towel at him. Your hands work, right? Dry yourself off, Daniel. That little movement will be good for your health. He gave me an angry stare and then did what he was told. After the bath, I helped him get dressed. Here, he also stared at me the entire time and kept smiling like a creep. I took him to the dining table and went to make him some food. I cooked enough pasta for him to live off for the entire week. 
and came back with two plates to eat. Um, Amy, before we eat, can you do something for me? Look, Daniel, I've got to get home early, and it's already difficult enough for me in life, so please don't... I'll pay you an extra $500 for this, so it'll be $800 a day. After this, I couldn't say no. That much money will help me get by for weeks until I can find a decent job. So, hell yeah. <sighs> what do you want me to do? Good girl. I just want to have a pleasant dinner with a pretty lady. You know, my wife's clothes are still in my bedroom. Why don't you wear something from that and join me? Really? You want me to wear your dead wife's clothes for $500? Please! I suppose it was better that he wanted me to wear clothes instead of asking me to take them off. I went to the bedroom and, oh my, there were so many dresses. Most of them felt new. Weird, huh? I chose a red dress and came back to the table. Wow! I bet you never looked this beautiful. Thanks. Let's eat so I can leave soon. We ate in silence. He just goggled at me with his eyes and it made me feel sick. But I needed the money, and as long as his hands were away from me, it was fine. I finished dinner and changed back into my clothes to leave. While giving me the money, his filthy hands brushed against mine. Pervert. I started walking to the door when he called out to me. Amy, one last thing. What now? I looked back in frustration and he suddenly got up. He grabbed his Polaroid camera from the shelf nearby and said, Do you mind if I take a picture of you, Amy? <coughs> I ran away. He didn't follow me. When I returned home, I broke down into tears. I wanted to burn the money he gave me, but then all that I had to put up with would have been in vain. I reported him to the cops the next day so that what he did to me doesn't happen to any other girls. But when the cops looked him up at his address, they said no one lived there. Hey guys, my name is Robert. My girlfriend and I live in a house in the woods away from people. It may be that moving away from the world may be frowned upon by everyone, but if you had a neighbor like Willie the Stalker, you would understand me. When we moved in, we immediately met William. Not because he showed up, but because both my girlfriend and I saw him spying on us from his house. The neighbors warned us that this man was in the neighborhood recently, and during that time he had terrorized the whole neighborhood. During the day, he only spied on people through the window, but at night, many said they saw him trying to enter the neighbors' houses or approaching the children to talk to them. I was sure that this was all a lie, as my neighbors also mistreated me for no reason in my previous neighborhood. To remove my doubts, I went to say hello to William while my girlfriend was unpacking. When I rang his doorbell, a strange man appeared. I greeted him in a friendly manner. But my optimism faded rather quickly. The man didn't return my greeting. He just stared at me with a tetric look that stopped my heart. He was full of pent-up anger and looked like he was going to open the door and attack me at any moment. Uh, hello? My name is Rob- That didn't end well. After that, I decided to listen to the neighbors. Maybe this was a man I should not approach. But in the next few days, I could not prevent him from approaching us for security reasons. On the same day we moved in, we installed a camera on the front door. The previous owner's door was broken for some reason. We finished with the move and settled in. But soon after, I realized that something was wrong. The camera was in a different position. Someone had moved it. I went to look at the recordings and, terrified, we saw how Willie had been trying to break our cameras. I was furious. And even though I let it go that day, I watched the next few days as the same thing happened over and over again until one day he broke the camera 
That had been the straw that broke the camcorder's back. Furious, I went to knock on the neighbor's door and, unlike the previous time, this one opened by itself and there was no one behind it. With some curiosity, I began to explore the dark house, but I saw no one nearby. I was struck by the fact that I saw many family pictures, but none of them was Willie. The lights could be turned on, but it would surely alert the man. I didn't know what I expected to find here. I knew this was trespassing, but I didn't care. I heard noises coming from the basement, so I went downstairs and began hiding. I slowly walked up the stairs to see what the sounds were. When I saw what was happening, I almost fell to the floor in terror. On the floor, chained together, were at least five people. All these people were naked, with their private parts covered by bandages. All the people were connected to each other as if they were a centipede. Their mouths were cooked to the back of their bodies. This was sickening and horrible. It was just like that movie. Have you seen the human centipede, Robert? Behind me, my neighbor stood with a sickly but shy smile, proud of what he had done. Isn't it beautiful? The movie inspired me to do this. The guy from the second movie was a rookie, but I am a doctor like the guy from the first movie. I can do this, and it's fascinating. Who are they? Oh, didn't you see the pictures on the way over? I'm not really your neighbor. They are. And you know what? You and your girlfriend will be next. Before the man could react or attack me, I began to beat him brutally. Something had taken over me. I hit him harder and harder until I wasn't even doing it in self-defense anymore. The people trapped in the centipede seemed terrified of me. By the time I was done with him, he was dead. Still alert, I heard someone start to come down the stairs. Wasn't Willie alone? I stole his gun and stood waiting. The footsteps became louder and louder, each one echoing throughout my body. I was terrified but ready. As soon as I saw a silhouette, I fired as fast as I could, and a dead body fell down the stairs. It, it was my girlfriend's. No, 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 no! What have I done? Suddenly, I felt someone crawling behind me. When I turned around, it was William. The man was still trying to attack me with a small knife. Ah! Ah! Still desperate. I unloaded all of my anger on him. This was the second person I had killed that day. I couldn't go to jail. Not again. If I wanted to get out of this, I would have to get my hands even dirtier. Crying, I put the gun to the family's head, and one by one, I began to execute them. I was aware that maybe they could be saved, but at that moment I lied to them, telling myself that I was doing them a favor. I buried the bodies in the backyard and wrapped my girlfriend's body in a bag and put it in the back of my car. We were both going on one last trip. I grabbed the most important things and I went to my uncle's house in the woods. I originally wanted to go there, but my girlfriend didn't want to. I guess what she wants won't be a problem now. I'm not going to lie to you. I'm more and more amazed at how easy it is to kill. Remember how I told you before that my former neighbors judged me and treated me badly? That was because I accidentally killed a teenager who wandered into our front yard. I made everyone think I shot him thinking that he was a thief. But the truth is, I knew what I was doing, and I liked it. I love my girlfriend, but I didn't like her opinions on things. So maybe it was a good thing I accidentally killed her. Although, sometimes I wonder how accidental it was. Nowadays, we are both far from civilization. There are no more noisy neighbors or stalker like Willie to ruin our days. My relationship with her is better than ever. We hardly even argue anymore, and we get along great. Who knew we just needed a little peace in our lives? The night was just beginning when the bus dropped me off, seemingly in the middle of nowhere. The bus took off before I could take in my surroundings and realize I was at the wrong stop. At first, I considered waiting at this lonely stretch of road for the driver to realize his mistake and come back for me. But as the taillights faded into the distance and the cold started to set in, I realized I would have to get moving or risk freezing. I started walking down the road, following the direction the bus had gone. It's been a few hours now and the bus never came back. 
I'm Noah, by the way. I'm 17, and I'm lost in the snow. I have no idea where I am. My phone's battery died a long way back. The air is getting colder and colder, sharper, more biting as I kept walking. Suddenly, I was flashed with light followed by the ring of a class bell. The light illuminated some kind of dark structure in the distance. I thought it could be an office block or something. I decided to go for it, turning away from the road and trudging a path through the fallen snow to the building's entrance. As I approached, I realized that the building wasn't an office at all. It was a school. Well, I didn't see that coming. It looked like it had been abandoned. I made my way to the dirty threshold, finding the doors unlocked. Strangely, the building still had electricity. Um, hello? Anyone here? I turned around hearing footsteps, but there was no one behind me. you you shouldn't be here a strange man stood right in front of me with the creepiest face i've ever seen his eyes look pure evil i've never seen so many teeth inside someone's mouth an awful smell was coming from his body that's when i noticed his feet he had no shoes his creepy fingers twitched like bugs you shouldn't be here Look, man, I want to leave too, but it's a blizzard out there and I'm lost. Fine! Sit in that corner and stay quiet! He glanced at his empty wrist like he was checking the time on his watch, then looked back at me with an angry face. Uh, I'm going to be late for class because of you. Class? What class? Shut up! My students have already arrived! They don't like anyone else's voice! Great. Now I've run into a lunatic. I watched him walk into the classroom on the left. Good morning, class. Sorry I'm late. Who the hell is he talking to? I tiptoed over for a sneak peek and saw the man was writing something on the blackboard. Broken chairs and benches stood opposite of him, on which sat worn-out teddy bears, each with different colors and sizes. The man kept talking to the toys. He was laughing, scolding them like they were all real kids. I thought about leaving, but reason he was just being a little creepy. I realized he must be some wacko homeless guy who also took shelter in this abandoned school like me. Maybe he got high and he was just on some sort of trip. After leaving him be, I walked to the end of the corridor. At the end stood the principal's office. I pushed the door open and immediately started vomiting. <laughs> The foul smell of something rotten choked my lungs. The room was filled with kids' diapers. Yes, use kids' diapers. I don't know how they all ended up in that room, but it was enough to convince me to go back to the highway. I turned around coughing and started running towards the door. Suddenly, the man came out of the class and grabbed my collar. He lifted me in the air and looked into my eyes. I told you to leave. Why did you go into my room? Are you incapable of following rules? What the hell is wrong with you? Put me down, you crazy! He threw me in the air. I landed on my chest and hurt my knees. The man then lifted his leg to stomp on me. I hate bad kids! Bad kids need to be punished! Ah! Ah! Before I could move, he stomped on my palm. He aimed for a second hit, but I rolled away. I got up, clutching my swollen hand. Look, look, I'm sorry, man. Just let, let me go. I'll never come back here, okay? <laughs> now you want to leave, but it's too late. My class is already in session, and you just made a boo-boo! <laughs> he jumped on me. I tried to run, but he grabbed my leg and dragged me into the principal's room. Time to change your diaper. Don't worry, I have lots of clean and fresh ones. <laughs> ah! No! Let me go! Leave me alone! Just then, the class bell rang again. The man stopped abruptly. He let go of me and again looked at his invisible watch. Well, lunch break's over. Time to get back to class. Acting like nothing happened, he completely ignored me and went back to teaching those teddy bears. I got up, 
Without wasting a single second, I ran past the door and escaped back to the snowy streets. I lumbered through the thick snow as if I were a prisoner who had just made a jailbreak. I fell, stood up, and then fell again, but I didn't stop. When I was approaching the highway, I saw headlights heading towards me. When the lights came close, I identified it as a pickup truck. The driver stopped and gave me a lift. Whoa, you don't look so good. What happened to you? Please, just drive! Drive! Okay, okay! Once we were finally away from that abandoned school, I told the man everything. He gave me some warm coffee from his flask and took me home. My parents were worried as hell. My dad thanked the truck driver and offered him some money for driving me all this way. The man refused to take it and warned me to be more careful next time. Before going in, I asked the man, Who lives in that abandoned school? Well, no one lived there for a while. But for the past few weeks, people have been seeing this crazy guy spending the night there. He used to be a teacher at a local school, but the school caught fire one day. No one escaped the blaze alive except him. Not even the kids. Oh my god. Yeah. People say a lot of things about how sick he is. Some even caught him stealing dead kids' toys from the cemetery. It's better to avoid that place. I went there in the morning the next day. But surprisingly, the entrance door was locked. I searched the area, but I didn't find any traces of that man. I was mopping the floor. Always being the last one to leave isn't at all a good feeling. I've been working as a Hooters girl for the past two years now, and it's the worst job for any woman, but I still do it because it pays well. <clears throat> My eyes shifted to the counter. A man dressed in an expensive suit was passing out on it. Um, sir? We're closed. I'm sorry, but you have to leave. Hearing my voice, he raised his head. His eyes were intoxicated. You... you want me to leave? And just for tonight. You can come tomorrow again. But I feel so lonely at home. My, my wife, she left me. That dirty witch was never faithful to me. Oh, no. Where is she now? Probably enjoying with her new lover in a bathtub. <laughs> Which? I felt very bad for the man. He was good looking and rich, yet after all that, he wasn't happy. All of a sudden, he grabbed my hand and looked into my eyes. Will you have dinner with me? I'm tired of eating alone. Um, I'm really tired today. Why don't you come here tomorrow and I will give you my entire attention? He took out $200 bills and asked, What if I pay you? It's only dinner. I, I swear I'm not a creep. I, I live in a pretty decent neighborhood. His sad voice melted my heart. Also, $200 just to have dinner that also comes free? Hell yeah. I agreed and we got into his shiny, luxurious Mercedes. He started driving and I rolled down the window. So, you live alone, huh? Yeah, I'm so alone that I get scared of my breath sometimes. We didn't talk and finally reached his villa. It was a big house. He parked the car and walked me in. I sat down on the comfy couch. The man asked me if I would like spaghetti and I nodded yes. The dinner was fun and I started liking him. I felt so heartbroken that a nice guy like him got cheated. I had a nice time, sir. I should leave now. Why don't you stay here? What? No, I, I don't mean to make you uncomfortable. I, I have the guest bedroom empty. No, I can't stay here. I'll pay you a thousand dollars just to sleep here. I'm scared to be alone in this house. Please? A thousand dollars for a night? All that money could help me to make my life better. I couldn't say no. He took me to his wife's bedroom and gave me one of her sleeping suits to wear. Whoa, she even left her clothes, huh? Yeah, she doesn't need them anymore. I didn't say anything anymore. Just changed into the nightdress and went to sleep in the guest bedroom. It was really weird that the man paid me such a hefty amount just to crash at his place, but I didn't think much. Once I got into the room, I locked it from inside and fell asleep. Half an hour later, I heard a crying sound coming from the living room. <laughs> 
It sounded like that man. I came out and saw that he was talking to someone standing out of his bedroom. Just leave. I don't want you here anymore. Realizing that his wife has come back, I fell into an awkward situation. I mean, nothing happened between us, but if his wife saw me, she will think something else. I changed back into my clothes and was about to leave when I heard a loud gunshot. Holy shit! I came out to the living room and found smoke coming out of the man's bedroom. My heartbeat got faster. I tiptoed to take a look. Was it what I was thinking? As I peeked in, I found the man lying on the floor. Smoke was coming out of his head. A gun was held in his right hand. I was in a house where the owner just shot himself. My legs started to shake. What will I do now? Should I call the cops? That's when I noticed the main door. It was locked, which means his wife is still here in the house. I called out to her, having no other option. Ma'am? Um, you here? I think your husband just... He deserved that! Her voice came from the bathroom. She sounded so cruel. I wanted to give her a tight slap and then call the cops to explain how this unfaithful wife drove her husband to commit suicide, but once I stepped into the bathroom, things took a completely different turn. I could see a woman sitting in the bathtub. The lights were off, so I couldn't see her face. I screamed at her. What kind of a person are you? Your husband just killed himself, and here, you're enjoying a bath? <laughs> Why do you care? Did a single night make you fall in love with him? Shut up! What do you know about love? I'm calling the cops, and I'll tell them how you're the one responsible for his death. Hmm. Go ahead. I was stunned to see her reaction. It was like she had no fear, no regret, no shame. I dialed 911, and my hands automatically went to the light switch. I wanted to look into her eyes and tell her what kind of a pathetic human being she is. But once the lights hit the bathroom floor, my phone fell from my hand and shattered. In that bathtub lay a bloody body of a woman. Her neck was slit, and her eyes were looking directly at me. The water in the tub was all red with her blood. If she's dead, then, then who was I talking to all this time? Who did this man talk to a few moments back? I picked up my broken phone and ran the hell out of that house. It was now clear to me that this man killed his wife hours back and came to Hooters to drown himself in sorrow. But the fact that somehow he was seeing the spirit of his wife gave me goosebumps. Maybe that's why he has to stay the night with him. He was not lying. He was scared to be alone in this house with the dead body of his wife. <laughs> This was meant to be the best decision of our lives. I and my darling wife Maria had just acquired a two hectare strip of land, sitting in a small village in the state side of Nevada. We had always craved to experience life in the country, and seeing as she was due in three months, it seemed like the best time to make the move. The property came at a steel price, and to make things even more interesting, the realtor said it already had a cornfield on it. It was too good to be true. But if only I had known the truth, I would have torn up those deed papers there and then. When we arrived, the scenery was just as gorgeous and serene as we had dreamed. A small cottage was standing in front of us and we could see the cornfield towering over it from behind. Maria walked towards the house with our pet dog Rex, while I carried out the rest of our stuff from the trunk. Suddenly, the dog began to bark incessantly like it had just seen the mailman. It bolted to the back of the house. Rex, come back! Maria called out, and she went after him. I was still very much preoccupied with the heavy bags when I suddenly heard a loud shriek. It was Maria's voice. My heart skipped a beat. Forthwith, I dropped everything and raced to the back of the house. Upon reaching there, Maria was panting heavily with her hand on her chest, while Rex seemed a lot more docile. What is it? I hastily asked. Oh, I'm sorry, honey. I was just frightened by the scarecrow. Maria responded. The what? I muttered to myself. 
Upon lifting my eyes, I was also left traumatized by the most disturbing and hideous looking scarecrows I had ever seen in my life, and they were pegged all over the cornfield. Ultimately, it seemed like a problem for another day, so we just left it alone and made our way into the house. Later that evening, we heard two resounding knocks on our front door. We had only just moved in, so we definitely weren't expecting any visitors. I approached the door and swung it open. It was an offbeat and tattered-looking old man, and he had a dirty inverted cross around his neck. He just stared at me with a blank expression on his face. Um, can I help you with something? I asked. You cannot help me, but I can help you. He responded. He forcefully dragged my hand, took the cross off his neck, and placed it in my open palm. He was pretty strong for a man his age. I felt harassed. I immediately retracted my hand. Hey, get your hands off me! I barked in outrage. There's no time to waste, son. The harvest is almost upon us. Hang the cross on your doorpost, or dire consequences shall follow. The old man ominously warned. I was still trying to figure out what was happening. Before I could ask any questions, he turned and fled into the darkness. It was a very curious encounter, but not one I had the energy for. I shook my head and slammed the door close. Honey, who was at the door? Nobody, sweetheart. Just a prankster. I responded. I momentarily glanced at the cross, then callously tossed it into the fireplace. By midnight, I was awakened by a very strange sound. It sounded like a clanging bell. I went downstairs in my PJs and drowsy eyes to investigate. The sound was coming from a grandfather clock in the living room, but what was most curious was the fact that I had never noticed the clock up until that night. The clock was also concealing a hidden door that had been chained shut. As I approached the clock, my eyes were drawn to window, where I met an even more bizarre sight. The scarecrows were all missing from their wooden posts. They were impossible to miss earlier, but at that moment, I couldn't even see one. Maybe it was just the extra glass of wine I had earlier. I turned around and stumbled back upstairs. My mind was probably just playing tricks on me. I observed the same phenomenon over a span of three days. By nighttime, the scarecrows were gone, but by morning, they would all return. I was bewildered. The villagers certainly put a lot of effort into their pranks. At least, that's what I believed. It wasn't until Rex went missing that I knew things had really gotten out of hand. I eventually found his decaying and maggot-infested body lying at the foot of one of those scarecrows within the cornfield. Blood was splattered all over the cornstalks, and a blood-drenched cleaver was lying beside him. Who could have done such a thing? I was still trying to figure out how to explain it to Maria when I suddenly bumped into the creepy old man again. Did you hang the cross like I told you? He abruptly asked. Uh... No, I burnt it. I responded, almost unapologetically. The old man hissed. Such was the fate of your predecessors. <sighs> Prepare your household. The harvest will begin after the eleventh hour. Hey, wait a minute. Do you know what happened to my... Before my eyes could transition from Rex's body and back, the old man had vanished without a trace. By midnight, just as he had said, I was awakened by the same clanging sound, but this time it was accompanied by a heavy ruckus coming from the cornfield. I peeped through the window to investigate, and a cold chill gripped my spine. It was unreal. It was petrifying. I became weak to my knees. The scarecrows were alive. Each of them wielded a crude farming tool, but it didn't look like they intended to plant seeds. In a panic, I grabbed my wife and hastily sprinted down the stairs. But before I could reach the front door, an axe was driven through it. They had encompassed the house and were forcefully trying to break in. Our last option was the eerie-looking door behind the grandfather clock. It was mysteriously now unlocked. We frantically charged into it. The door closed by itself. 
Within the room, we found dark scrolls, ancient relics, fetish ornaments, and sinister-looking books, all of which seemed to make mention of a curse and an ancient ritual called the Harvest. From what we could gather, if we had just placed the cross on our doorpost like the old man had cautioned, we would have been exempt from the reckoning. But since we... Uh, I was reluctant, our fate would pretty much be similar to our multitude of predecessors who were either rotting away or had already turned into piles of ashy bones within the cryptic room. God help us. Wow, that was scary! Hi, my name is Alex, and that video you just saw wasn't just from a random haunted movie theater. It's the place that just hired me. It's no coincidence that I got a job there. I'm a big fan of the paranormal, and that place is known to be haunted, so no one wants to take the vacancy. I, for one, am a big fan of the occult, so I couldn't pass up that opportunity. You could say that my first day on the job was almost my last as the day didn't start off well at all. That day, I was cleaning the aisles of the cinema when I heard a voice calling me from one of the rooms. Alex. Alex. I approached slowly. My first half hour at work and I was already being called by a spirit? I took out my cell phone and started filming. At that moment, I was very scared. And with every step I took towards where that voice was coming from, it made my skin crawl. I got closer and closer, so much so that I could already feel the breath of the person who was talking to me. I wanted to turn back, but I couldn't regret it now. Boo! Ah! As I looked in the direction of that noise, it wasn't a ghost. It was a co-worker wearing an Annabelle mask. Other employees came out of their hiding places laughing loudly and welcomed me. After that, I wasn't so scared anymore. I continued sweeping alone until suddenly, a voice called me over the loudspeakers telling me to go to the boss's room. When I got there, I found Mikhail, the owner of the movie theater. He seemed to be a grumpy and impatient man. He was furious when I asked him if there were any ghosts and he told me it was all bullshit. After that, he sent me to clean only the movie theaters, and that's when it all happened. I started cleaning the back room, an empty room. Everything was going well, but something started to bother me. A strange metallic smell was spreading throughout the room. From one second to the next, the temperature dropped so low it was almost unbearable. I looked up and saw a boy in front of me. Had he snuck in? I chased him to the main screen, but in the blink of an eye, the boy had disappeared. Before I could react, the projector in the room turned on and started projecting a black and white movie. I turned around to see it, and it wasn't any film in the wallet. It was tapes of horrible, uncensored torture. This was definitely a joke in bad taste. I turned around angrily and automatically fell to the floor in terror. Every seat in the room was taken. All the people in the seats were in black and white, wearing odd clothes. But the strangest thing was that they were glitching, as if they were part of an old movie. I walked slowly towards the exit door. All those people were following me with their eyes, with glaring red eyes that shone like lights and contrasted with their black and white bodies. When I reached the exit door, I opened it slowly, but something interrupted me. Next to me was a shadowy person almost six feet tall. The person with a hazmat suit used to combat radiation grabbed me by the hair and dragged me back to the center of the screen, where it released me. As I watched, the person in the hazmat suit took off the helmet, and behind it, there was a woman in black and white, but something was wrong with her face. Half of it was burned off. You could see pieces of flesh and even a skull, it was as if she had a horrible acid accident. Without the slightest contemplation, the woman pulled out a small scalpel and threw herself on top of me. When I tried to react, it was too late. The 
woman was cutting open my belly and pulling out all my guts while the audience watched in amazement and applauded. Suddenly, the door opened violently and someone came walking towards where I was. It was my boss. Sir! Run! The ghosts are real! Oh, I was looking for you. Out of nowhere, my boss grabbed the disfigured woman's face and pulled her close to his. The man began to kiss the girl passionately. As he turned around and looked back at me, something in him had changed. His lips were disintegrated, and there was a huge hole in his throat as if he had swallowed lava. What are you doing lying there on the floor, bleeding to death like a good-for-nothing? You are useless! I knew I couldn't trust you. I should have never hired you! At that moment, I looked down at my body. I was unharmed. I had no wounds. I stood up and ran to the exit door, where some co-workers tried to scare me again. But this time, when they saw my face, they were the ones who were scared. A few minutes later, I was taken to the boss's office, and there I met him. He was not the same boss I had met before. He was much younger and more caring. He told me that this place is haunted, and that is why the movie theater remains attractive to teenagers. He also told me that this place used to be not a movie theater, but a clandestine place used in the war to torture people. Many wealthy citizens would come and watch this sitting down as if it was a show. And the man who claimed to be my boss was the owner of the place, while the lady in the hazmat costume was his wife, who died in a fire while torturing a little boy. From that day on, I strictly followed all the rules of the cinema. I never had to interact with any ghosts, and in case I cleaned up alone and felt cold or had a strange smell, I had to leave. If I followed all the rules, I didn't have to be afraid. This was just another job. Hey guys, my name is Leon, and my girlfriend's name is Ashley. We were both on a trip to my parents' house, but I must admit that by trying to take a shortcut, I got us lost. It was getting dark and we had to spend the night in a motel, so I stopped at a gas station and asked where there was one. The man at the gas station was... just terrifying. His face was completely deformed. The only eye the man had was pure white. I could swear the eye was plastic, but somehow he could see us. The nearest motel is a few miles away, strangers, but be careful. God is more present than ever in these lands. His eyes will be upon you at all times. Uh, sure. Thank you. We both continued on our journey, and as the terrifying man said, the motel was only a few miles away. I didn't want to probe into what he meant by bad habits. I just wanted to get away from him as fast as possible. When we entered the motel, the owner, who was sitting motionless in his chair, seemed nice enough, but something disturbed us. His smile was dark, almost obsessive. Although we were very well taken care of, we felt that we didn't belong there. But we couldn't continue driving at night. The road was complicated. I was sleepy and Ashley didn't know how to drive. We went into the room and left our things, but we couldn't help but feel watched. I walked quickly to the curtain and violently opened the window. A silhouette came out desperately. Someone was spying on us. I didn't get to see the person behind the curtain. I only saw how a part of his silhouette was walking calmly as if nothing had happened. I hate this crappy motel. Just, let's go to sleep. Let's lock the door and close the windows. Yeah, we'll leave in the morning. Ashley fell asleep pretty quickly. I could tell she was more tired than I was. Even though I was very sleepy, I just couldn't sleep. I felt watched. I felt that someone was close to us. Suddenly, I heard a noise inside the room. It wasn't a person. It was a metallic noise. I woke Ashley up and turned on the lights. We started looking for where the noise was coming from. It was a camera. A camera was spying on us from a vase. We kept looking and found cameras everywhere. The walls, the furniture, even a screw on the bed. Furious, I told Ashley to stay in the room and went straight to the owner's room. I told him everything that was going on with enormous anger, but something about his smile made the anger go away. He just looked at me happily with a twisted, macabre smile. 
As he listened to me, I was shaking. It was as if he was about to explode from the pent-up anger he felt as if he was compelled not to stop smiling. Sir, are you accusing me of filming a client? Our motel may be small, but here we make sure our clients have the stay of a lifetime. I know what I saw. It was full of cameras and... I interrupted my own sentence when I realized that the man had a huge knife in his hands. As if realizing he had been discovered, the man jumped out of his chair with the knife and fell to the floor where he slowly crawled in my direction. Sir, I think you owe me and the hotel an apology. Here we do nothing but offer you the best service. This man was crazy. I had to find Ashley and leave as soon as possible. As I ran to our room, I couldn't help but notice something. The man is a cripple. When I opened the door to the room, my girlfriend was not alone. The man we had met at the gas station was grabbing Ashley's neck and holding a knife to her throat. Leon! Help! Let her go! You shouldn't have broken God's eye, strangers. Now you can't leave. I lunged violently at the man, but without letting go of Ashley, he kicked my chest with his huge boot and threw me several feet back. Effortlessly, he lifted my girlfriend up and started walking towards the exit. I tried to get up but immediately fell back to the ground with no air. That kick had really hurt me. The man was already by the exit, and I couldn't do anything but watch him until something stopped him. Ah! The Taurus, I have asked you not to bring your Catholic things into my hotel. Don't you see that you scare my customers? Furious, the man grabbed the hotel owner by the head and lifted him up. With brute force, he began to squeeze his skull harder and harder. Over oh, Ramon, you were always a disappointment to both God and me. Always obsessed with this piece of stone. Ha! Ah, let me go! Luckily, I haven't considered you my father for a long time. My only father is up there, and he wants to see you personally, to say a few words to you. Ashley saw me terrified, and with all my strength, we took advantage of this moment to run as fast as we could out of the hotel. As we went down the corridor, I turned around and watched, as with one last effort, the man exploded the crippled skull with his fingers, cracking it like a pumpkin. We ran to the car, but it wouldn't start. What the hell is wrong with this? It's never failed me before! Leon, look! A few yards away, there was a trail of gasoline coming from our car, and at the end of the trail, an engine was on the ground. That was the engine of my car. We got out with bloody hands, and a few meters away, a man who called himself Vittores walked in our direction. Oh, dirty sinners. You are no longer welcome in these lands. Flee, or the divine fury will fall upon you. In response, we ran as fast as we could down the road until we could not breathe from exhaustion. We had lost track of the Torres, the gas station, or the motel. In the longest minutes of our lives, a couple picked us up on the highway and took us to the nearest town. We never heard from the strange man again. From that day on, Ashley learned to drive, and today we take turns driving. We will never park in a motel again. It was a bright moonlit night. I went camping at the sea, and I carried my tent into the pickup truck. I was about to reach it when the sky turned black and heavy rain started. I suddenly felt the urge to relieve myself, so I checked the GPS. The destination was near. Hence, I parked the truck under a palm tree and got down to do my business. The headlights were on. A sandy trail surrounded by palm and date trees stood ahead. The sea was near. I could feel the heavy wind blowing my hair and clothes. I was done when... I heard a woman scream. I jumped right into my car and in a panic to start the engine, I turned it off instead. It got dark and looked very spooky in the moonlight, but I quickly turned on the engine and I saw a woman standing on the side of the road with her head slightly down with her brown hair covering her face. Her body was so pale that I could see her veins popping out on the skin. 
I rolled down my driver's side window and called out to her. Hey, you all right? No. She nodded her head and slowly started to walk towards my window. She had scratches all over her body and was limping. She stopped next to my window and lifted her face. Her eyes were bright neon yellow, which was very unusual. Do you need help? She suddenly smiled ear to ear and tilted her neck to one side. Her eyes weren't blinking as she kept watching me in that scary manner. Suddenly, she looked behind her and ran into the bush at full speed. Now, I was already uncomfortable enough about this encounter with this strange woman, so I stayed behind the line. I've already asked her if she needed it several times, and no way I'm following some random freaky woman into the woods. I started my car and drove ahead. The rain stopped by the time I reached the stranded beach. I put up my tent and made some roasted chicken. I was three bottles down when I heard a chuckling sound coming from a distance. I could a red pickup truck parked quite far away from me. Someone was also camping on that beach. I saw it was the girl sitting with a middle-aged creepy dude. He was laughing and holding her hand whilst the girl sat still like a stone. Suddenly, she started coughing. <coughs> hey, do you want some water? But the girl now started breathing heavily, and then she got up and fainted. The dude grabbed her and looked around. He couldn't see me as I was sitting in the dark. Everything happens for a reason. <laughs> he carried the girl inside his small tent and then came back, but this time he had no shit on. He chugged the entire beer in one breath and headed back to the tent with a big smile. Shit, I need to do something. I realized the man was going to abuse the poor girl, taking advantage of her physical condition. I grabbed a hockey stick. I always bring one on my camping trips. I started walking towards the red pickup truck. My hands were tightly gripping the hockey stick. Any weird occurrence and I won't hesitate to use it. Just when I reached close to the tent, I heard a squinching sound, followed by loud chewing. Not being able to see anything in the dark, I turned on my flashlight and pointed it inside the tent. The middle-aged shirtless creep was now lying lifeless, and the girl was sitting over him and eating his flesh. Her eyes were glowing like a hyena. She ate like she hadn't eaten in years. I was too stunned to move, but then she slowly lifted her head and looked at me. Her blue eyeballs were now gloomy white. She moved her head from left to right, but she couldn't see me. It was like she lost her vision. Her mouth was smeared in blood, so were her hands and clothes. I took a step back to leave and accidentally made a sound. Within a second, she lunged at me, letting out an animalistic growl. I fell back on the soft sand and the girl grabbed my leg. She then went to bite it, but I kicked her in the face with the other leg to get rid of her. The kick broke her nose, but yet she kept crawling on the sand. I finally realized that somehow this girl has turned into a zombie. I ran back to my truck and drove off, leaving my tent behind. I just wanted to get the hell out of that place. I came back to the same path where I stopped to pee. I looked at the side of the road where I first saw the girl. Now, two men were sitting in crouched positions. They were eating a dead deer. Somehow, the lights didn't affect them. I honked the car horn and they looked at me almost immediately, so they only heard sounds. I started the car engine to drive past when suddenly a group of ravenous, insane human-like creatures appeared from the side of the road. Their face and their body all were mutilated. Some had hands, but no legs. Some were walking like dead bodies. What's happening? They all were coming to my car. I knew if I don't drive away now, this swarm of zombies will turn me into them. But what will happen if I left? They will grow more, and it'll be the end of the world. The only way out is to finish them before I go. An idea came to mind. I had three jars of petrol hoarded before the long drive. 
I drove the car over each zombie before it could come close to my car. I lost count of how many times I ran over them again and again. When there was none left, I sprinted petrol all over the meaty mess and set it on fire. I watched all those infectious humans turn to dust. Maybe they came with the wish to spend a holiday at the beach, but something changed them. It turned them into brainless monsters who only crave meat, who are always hungry. I've never seen that girl, and so far no reports of infections or contagious diseases have been reported in the news. The year is 2019 now, and I hope 2020 will finally be able to erase the horrible memory of that night from my mind. I just hope someone from the future could come and assure me that 2020 is going to be a good year. <laughs> I came to Japan to work as a nurse in a post-surgical unit. Patients come from hundreds of miles away to get their operations here. The surgeons are known to be the best. But what we don't tell the patients, what we're not supposed to tell them, is that this one is haunted. There have been more than a few events that have raised the hair on the back of my neck and some have sent me into hysterical screaming fits. There was that time a few months ago when a patient told me she saw a woman wearing a red kimono stand beside her bed and watch her all night. The patient didn't see her face as her black hair covered it. Really? Where did you see her? There. She was standing right there. The patient pointed at the curtains with a fearful face. I pulled back the curtains and showed her myself. All of the other beds were empty and there was no visitors or staff in the room with her. As if that wasn't disturbing enough, a few weeks later a different patient said the same thing, when she had been left alone in the same room. Did you see her face? Oh, no, but I... I saw something else? The patient was trembling like a timid rabbit. What did you see? Her head was touching the ceiling. <gasps> Her neck stretched up so high, almost like a snake. Now that made my skin crawl a bit. I looked at the watch. It was 2.30 in the morning and I was already tired from pulling a night shift back to back in a row. I gave the patient some medicines to help her sleep. Once she fell asleep, I decided to stay awake in that ward. The ward has six beds and only one of them has a patient. Rests were neatly made white beds waiting for their temporary owner. I picked up a magazine and sat on a chair. After 15 minutes, I could barely keep my eyes open. I knew it was against hospital rules, but I still laid down on the corner side bed. It was honestly a quick and much needed nap. I don't recall the time when I heard running footsteps on the wooden floor. I got up thinking someone has come, but found no one. The ward was empty like before. The one patient was now snoring. Um, hello? Is anyone here? <laughs> My senses sharpened once I heard a woman's chuckling voice. The door was closed like I had left it a few moments back. This proves that the chuckle took place inside this room. Mrs. Tanaka? Are you sleepwalking again? <laughs> I couldn't turn on the lights as it'll wake up the ailing patient. The night lamp wasn't enough, so I switched on the flashlight on my phone and saw a woman dressed in a red kimono standing right beside the door. She was far from me, so I couldn't see her face, but one thing I could tell was that she was staring at me with an ear-to-ear -ear smile. Ah! Oh, God! A sudden call from my mom almost gave me a heart attack. <sighs> Hi, Mom. Why are you still awake? Coco, are you all right? I'm perfectly fine, but why are you asking me this in the middle of the night? I... I had a very bad dream. Where are you? I'm at the hospital, Mom. Where else would I be? It's my night shift. Again. Did you say night shift? Yeah, why? I just saw you dozing off at your night shift and you were being watched by this strange woman. She wore this red kimono and was... Before my mom could finish her sentence, the call got disconnected. The phone dropped off from my shivering hands. 
With a slow, erratic heartbeat, I turned around where I saw the creepy woman a few seconds back. But she was gone. Uh, hello? What do you want? My eyes searched the entire room, but the woman was nowhere to be seen. Suddenly, my phone lit up once again. It was again my mom calling. I crouched down to pick up my phone and accidentally my eyes went towards the patient's bed. I could see a pair of red feet peeking under a red kimono. I jumped and looked above the bed. There was no one. What? Is this a nightmare? By now, I have started to lose my mind. I just saw a woman's feet under the bed, but when I looked up, there was no one standing beside the patient's bed. I crouched down once again, and now again, I saw those bare feet. The nails on the big toes were missing, revealing the red, puffy flesh underneath. I froze in that position. I was scared to look up when suddenly the feet started rotating to the back. A loud, horrifying sound of bones breaking took place with each movement of them. My voice died down in my throat. I knew what the patients kept saying about this ward is true, and I might not probably make it out of this room alive tonight. Just when I was on the verge of crying, the woman's neck dropped in her head. Her head started to roll down on the floor. Like a snake, her long neck stretched to inhuman lengths and started coming at me. Help! Help! I got up and started running towards the opposite side. I aimed for the door, but before I could get out, I tripped and fell. <laughs> I laid on my back, knowing the laughter has come from a close distance. I didn't want to turn around, but I knew I have to. My head slowly arched back to catch a glimpse, and the woman's head was touching the ceiling. Her mouth was open, and blood was dripping from it. Her swirled, twisted neck moved side to side like a bobbing spring. I don't remember when I fainted. I naturally left that job at the hospital after my parents picked me up from the hospital. I was down with a fever. My grandma says Japanese people believe in this urban legend, which goes by the name Rokurokubi. They are said to be vengeful spirits roaming around at night. They love drinking their victim's blood, which made sense for her bleeding mouth. I don't know why she let me go or any other patient who stayed in that ward. There's still no news of her hurting anyone, but I guess she gets bored alone. Hence, decides to play with people for her entertainment. Whatever the reason may be, I'm never going near that hospital ever again. My grandfather left me his old farmhouse before his death. I always wanted a place like this, so as soon as I finished college, I came here to write my book. But the moment I stepped into my bedroom and I saw a huge, ugly bat hanging from my bedroom ceiling, I called out to the housekeeper, Carmel. What is it, sir? Get that filthy thing out of my room! I hate bats! Oh, that one. They all live in the cemetery behind the lake. Must have gotten in from the window. Telling Carmel to prepare my dinner, I went to freshen up. When I came back, I found that the bat was gone. Finally, what a relief. After gobbling two chicken legs and a bowl filled with noodles, I set out for an evening stroll. I took the path at the back of my house. After walking for seven minutes straight, I found the old cemetery Carmel mentioned in the afternoon. A pebbled, paved path leads into the cemetery. The gravestones were quite old and had moss and wild saplings growing over them. I was reading the epitaphs on the grave when I heard footsteps behind me. You don't like bats, do you? How do you know? <laughs> I was nearby when you were telling your housekeeper to get rid of it. Oh, I see. The man took off his big black hat and bowed his head like an English lord. Welcome to Blist's Hill. I'm your neighbor, Vincent Malfoy. Uh, I'm Joe. I just moved here. Splendid! Finally a neighbor! <laughs> Seeing that it was getting dark, I slowly started walking towards the house. The man, too, followed me. I was feeling a bit uncomfortable in his presence. The way he talked without blinking made me cringe. I do enjoy wandering around the church cemetery in the evening. 
I nodded my head and tried to turn on my flashlight to get a clear view of the road. It blinked twice and then stopped working. Damn it! Don't worry, I can see very well in the dark. Careful, there's a hole ahead. Vincent grabbed my hand and pulled me to his left. His touch was icy cold. I felt a shiver down my spine. Then, suddenly, he asked, What do you know about vampires? I wasn't ready for such an odd question, so it took some time to reply. Uh, blood-sucking bats are called vampire bats. I don't know if this bat exists in our country, though, but I have read about vampire bats in foreign books. Um... Also in ghost stories, it's said that when dead bodies come out of their graves to suck the blood of sleeping humans, they too are called vampires. <laughs> right. I felt annoyed by his question. For a few minutes, none of us talked and just kept walking on the dark road surrounded by woods. When I almost reached close to my house, the man suddenly said, It was a pleasure meeting you. How long you're going to be here? Probably a month, or maybe more. Good, good, very good. <laughs> he then lifted his long bony finger and pointed out towards the cemetery, saying, You will see me if you come that way after sunset. My paternal grandfather's grave is also there. Tomorrow I will show you. Flashing his yellow teeth once again, he disappeared into the dark woods. A coyote howled from the distance just then. That night, I had a weird dream. It was about Vincent Malloy. <laughs> I spent the entire afternoon working on my book. Around five in the evening, I went out for some fresh air. I had no wish to see Vincent, so I went the opposite way from the cemetery. But within five minutes, he caught up to me. Joe! Wait! Ah, damn it. I tried to walk away, but he was so quick. He stopped right in front of me, blocking my way. Did you sleep well last night? Why does he always ask the weirdest questions? I started walking, saying, Yes, I did. Good. <laughs> good, very good. I can't sleep at night. I sleep during the day and wander around all night. I see. The cemetery is my favorite place. I feel so fascinated to think about all the dead bodies buried here are sleeping for decades. But they don't enjoy being in a box. I often hear them weeping at night. All they want is to come out and be alive again. <laughs> I couldn't tolerate his useless rant anymore. Look, Voldemort, or whatever your name is, I have no time for your moronic bullcrap, so just leave me alone, okay? I went to my house and for one last time turned back to see if he was following me. He didn't. He just stood there with a cold, expressionless face, his eyes glowing in the dark. Once I got home, I laid down on my bed, thinking I'd had to tolerate this jackass neighbor for months now. I must have dozed off when a pair of wings flapped over my head. Opening my eyes, I saw a huge bat hanging from the ceiling, staring down at me. Its green, burning eyes made my skin crawl. Without taking my eyes off the creature, I reached for my hardbound notebook on the bedstand. Within two to three seconds, the bat jumped aiming for my throat, flashing its sharp fangs, and I hit it with all my strength. It flew away from the window, landing in the backyard. At the very next moment, I heard the sounds of rustling footsteps fading away. When I looked outside the window, I saw no one. The bat was nowhere to be found. The next morning, I woke up hearing chaos outside my house. Few local people were carrying Vincent Malloy on their shoulders. Vincent's forehead was covered with clotted blood. When I asked what happened, one man said he might have fallen from the tree and cracked his head. What was he doing on a tree? This man is one crazy wacko. He loves climbing the tree and hanging upside down. Just like... Just, just like a bat.
I always hated school. Ever since I was a little kid, I hated the idea of it. Being trapped in a room with a bunch of annoying kids for several hours every day. Learning stuff that you'd actually never use in real life. It was a recipe for disaster. Fights, bites, bullying, you know, the usual. As I got older, my feelings didn't change. So, when I got to middle school, I started skipping class. I take the dirt path that broke off from the road to school and cut into the woods on my bike. Or I'd sneak out of class with a few other like-minded students and hide under the bleachers, where we'd play video games and goof off for a while. My grades were plummeting, as I was rarely ever in school. So when the time for high school came, my parents sent me away to some fancy schmancy boarding school to keep me in check. But you know what they say, old habits die hard. It took me some time, but I found a new clique of kids who showed me the ropes. We swapped out our video games for other things. Cigarettes for one. We met a few days a week at a secret spot on the outskirts of the school property and as usual, got up to no good. It was one such day that I heard it. What do you think that is? Hell if I know. Come on, Zack, pass the lighter. It was a dark, guttural sound. The dying squeals of an animal being slaughtered. We stepped out of the cover of our spot to look for the source of the sound. It was coming from a clearing, just at the edge of the school grounds. Just past where Mr. Friedman lived. Mr. Friedman, you see, was the school groundskeeper. A janitor in less fancy terms. He did most of the mopping and sweeping and fixing up around the school. And there was no one who knew the place better than he did. He knew all the nooks and crannies that students like me hid out in. He had even caught us a couple of times, with cigarettes in hand and everything. He never said a word, though. He'd just turn around and carry on with his day like nothing had happened. That should have made more students like him, but that wasn't the case. Far from it, there was something creepy about the man. It was hard to put into words. He walked with a terrible limp and his skinny frame was always bent over in a hunch. He smelled like old boots and was always muttering things under his breath. Most students who saw him coming ran the other way. Others just kept their distance. And as I was about to find out, for good reason too. You think Friedman's the one doing this? It sounds so... brutal. I don't know, man, but I don't think it's wise to stick around and find out. Oh, don't be a wuss, Frankie. Come on. I've never been this far out before. Me neither. You think Mr. Friedman lives here? It's a dump. I'm not sure, but knowing how weird he can be, I wouldn't count it out. Are you sure we shouldn't turn around? I've got a bad feeling about this place. When was the last time you did something this intriguing, huh? You can run back off to class if you want, but I'm going in. Are you with me or not? I'm with you. I wish I had turned back then. I wish I had just gone back to our spot or back to class or something. Anywhere would have been better than here. We pushed the door open and it gave way with the loud creak. Almost like a warning sign for us to get as far away from the shack as possible. But we didn't listen. I didn't listen. There was a flight of stairs just inside the shack, leading several meters downward into some sort of basement or cellar. It was pitch dark so I fished out the lighter from my pocket to light our way down the stairs. When I saw what was hidden down there, my heart dropped to my stomach. There were about a dozen chairs, arranged in front of a blackboard, just like in a classroom. And the seats were, oh my god, and the seats were dead pigs, and they were all stuffed into our school uniforms. I covered my mouth with my hand, but Frankie had already fallen to the ground, throwing up all of his breakfast. Is that supposed to be... us? Oh my god, he's crazy! Mr. Friedman is freaking crazy! Keep your voice down, Frankie. He could be around here somewhere. We've got to get out of here, quick. Don't tell me to calm down! Don't you see that? Don't you... <coughs> Maybe it was Frankie's screams. Maybe it was just bad luck. But by the time I helped my friend back to his feet into the foot of the stairs... There was someone standing at the top looking down at us. I couldn't make out any features in his silhouette, but as he came down the stairs, I saw his signature limp. 
Mr. Friedman had returned and he held a butcher's knife in one hand. No, no, no. How on earth did you boys find your way down here? We... We got lost, that's all. We're just on our way out. We won't bother you again, sir. You got lost, eh? I struggle to find any good reasons as to why you were out here in the first place, but I'll let it slide, just this once. I nodded and said a silent prayer of thanks in my mind. I tried to drag Frankie out behind me, but my friend had other plans. You psychopath! Frankie reached out for a stretch of wood that was propped up by the corner and swung at Mr. Friedman. But the man caught the stick and pushed Frankie into the wall. (sighs) All you had to do was stay quiet. He picked the stick up, and in a moment I'm not proud of, I ran. I ran toward the door at the top of the stairs, but I tripped and, when I woke up, I was safe and sound in the school clinic. By my bedside was a note. Stay quiet. Stay safe. I haven't heard from Frankie in a few days now. He's been declared missing and the cops came down to the school for a search. I'm too scared to say anything because when I look over my shoulder, Mr. Friedman is always there, watching, waiting. I don't think that I'll ever work again. Let me tell you why. My name is Anna, and I'm experiencing one of the most traumatizing moments of my life. It started a day ago when I looked through the papers for a new job. I live in government housing, and I was unemployed, so a listing quickly caught my eye. Set assistant, it said. All I had to do was call in and give my name and address, so I did. Hello, I'm calling about the set assistant position. Is it still available? Hello, yes it is. Can I have your name and address? It was a big mistake, but I gave the man on the other line my name and address, and he said I could start right away. He gave me the address of the warehouse, and I hopped on a bus to get there. When I arrived, the air was thick with the smell of mold and decay. The floor was littered with broken and discarded items. I had a feeling that this wasn't going to be the job I thought it was. The tall, imposing manager greeted me. As I looked upward, I couldn't help but feel off-put by his appearance. His skin was a mottled gray and yellowed color, and his eyes were shaped like those of a snake. His very thin lips were curved downward, as if he was always frowning. You're the set assistant, right? Your job is to move furniture and props around when they're needed. Don't open any boxes. That's the number one rule. Okay, that makes sense. Still, I couldn't help but feel uneasy. But the manager was swift and brief with his introduction, and soon I was working. I hadn't even realized that he had followed me until he was right behind me, watching me move boxes and furniture around. As the hours dragged on, the manager left me to complete my work and disappeared entirely. As for the boxes that I had to move, they kept getting heavier and heavier, till I was straining with each step. I felt like I was being watched, and it made me uncomfortable. I couldn't help myself. I probably would have been safe if I hadn't, but you understand that I'm a curious person, and I needed to know what I was moving. And so, I opened one of the boxes. Some packing peanuts spilled out. I recoiled from the smell, which drafted upward out of the box, a rotten and sickly smell. And then I saw it, a hand, rotting and mangled, sticking out of the packing peanuts. Just then I heard a voice behind me, it was the manager. He shouted at me, rage filling his voice. What did I tell you about touching the boxes? I told you not to touch the boxes! In his hand, he held a crowbar, and he waved it at me wildly. You're fired! Fired! He grabbed me roughly by the arm and dragged me, struggling, into a back room. He pushed me onto a chair and handcuffed my hands to the armrests on either side. He sighed. What? What are you doing? Let me go! No, no, no. I can't do that. You're a witness now. 
I would have let you transfer my product and paid you well to do it, but now that you know what I'm doing, I can't trust you. Now I need to call someone who will take care of you. He walked out of the room, his lanky body almost dancing away, leaving me alone to struggle with the handcuffs. I guess I was lucky that I was so poor because my thin wrists were able to slip out of the cuffs. Desperate, I ran out of the warehouse, my heart pounding in my chest. The manager had disappeared into a small room and I figured he was on the phone with someone. If he caught me now, I would be done for. I ran and ran until I got to a police station. Breathless, I told the officers my story. They dispatched a few officers to the warehouse and one of the officers said he'd drive me home and I gratefully accepted. As we drove, however, I quickly realized something. Where are you headed? This isn't the way to my house. I'm just taking a quick detour. Don't worry about it. But in the mirror, I could see the evil glint in his eyes. And then I realized where he was driving. Back to the warehouse where I had just escaped. I grabbed the handle of the door, threw it open, and jumped out of the car while it was still moving. I ran and ran until I reached home, my arms and legs burning with exhaustion. I hid in my bedroom, not knowing who to tell or what to do. Who should I tell? What do I do? As I sat there panicking, I suddenly heard my phone ring. I shouldn't have answered the unknown caller, but I did. I recognized the voice on the other side of the line immediately. You're not thinking straight, are you? I'm coming to your house now. Don't move a muscle. I quickly hung up the phone and scrambled away from the window, turning off all the lights and locking every door. With a sinking feeling in my heart, I realized that I had stupidly given the manager my address. At that moment, I felt more scared than I ever had in my life. All I could do was wait and hope he would go away if I stayed perfectly still and silent. I could hear the car pull up outside, and I prayed that he had changed his mind. But then, I heard the door handle turn, and my heart sank. I knew I was in trouble. I recently went to watch Scream 6, alone. I booked a corner seat with an orange Slurpee. It was a late night show, so there was a handful of people in the movie theater. My eyes were hooked on the screen when I saw this girl sitting in the same row. She was highly overweight and had a tub of popcorn on her lap. The way she was eating, it gave me yuck. Her mouth opened into a black hole and she tossed thousands of popcorns in each bite. Some popcorn fell on her lap, some on her stained t-shirt. A few were even hanging on her locks, but nothing stopped her from eating. Suddenly, a skinny man came and sat beside her, and this is when things started to get weirder. The skinny dude looked like a stick beside a blob of flesh. Together, they were unimaginable, and so was their conversation. Do you want more? Yes, yes, give me more. But it won't be free. I will do anything. Um, but I don't think you'll be able to do that. The girl started stomping her feet like a nine-year-old. No, I can. I will just feed me. A cruel smile appeared on the man's face. He took out a candy bar from his pocket and started swinging it in front of the girl's face. The moment the girl saw it, her eyes went wide. Her mouth started to drool. She took out her tongue and started... started panting like a dog. What the hell is happening with these two? I was feeling extremely uncomfortable, yet couldn't help but watch them. The man leaned onto her and I guess he kissed her. Once he was done, he gave her the candy bar. The girl ate it like a hungry walrus. It was clear to me that this man was taking advantage of the girl using her weakness for food. During the interval, they both got up and the man said, Let's go somewhere where we can be alone. Will there be food? Yes. Yes. Just come. They got up to leave and I decided to follow them. I wanted to help the girl if the man gave her any trouble. I watched them walk to the parking lot. The man and the girl got into a red pickup van and drove away. I was behind them in my scooter, maintaining a safe distance. After five minutes, they stopped near a graveyard. Really? A graveyard? The skinny dude is a hell of a creep. 
It took time for the girl to get down from the car. I heard the man yell, Come on! Move your heap of flesh faster! They entered the graveyard. I parked my scooter behind a bush and followed them. The man sat down under a tree and asked the girl to sit beside him, but for the first time, she refused him. Where are my chicken nuggets? You said you had chicken nuggets! I said you'll get it once you make me happy. No! Give me my chicken nuggets first! The man lost his temper. I didn't bring such a loser like you here to just feed your pathetic self. Now sit here and do what you're supposed to! I'm leaving. You are mean. She turned to leave, but the man grabbed her hand. She pushed him away and the dude fell like a twig. Realizing the girl is stronger than him, he got furious. He grabbed a stone from the ground and came at her. I'll kill you, you witch! I couldn't remain quiet anymore. I jumped from the bush, screaming. Amy, he's behind you! What happened next was not planned. Amy turned back and grabbed the man's arm with which he was holding the stone. Then, she started twisting it. <laughs> Do you know what my favorite sound is? Ah! Let me go! Leave me, you giant! The sound of bones cracking! Amy broke his arm and the man let out a spine-chilling scream. He fell to the ground with terror in his eyes. He looked at me. Who, who are you? How do you know her? This is when I couldn't pretend anymore. I mean, he's about to die anyway, so it would be wrong to lie to a dying man. I grinned and took out a big lollipop from my pocket. I looked at Amy and said, You know what to do next, sis? Do you want my help? Is that for me? I don't know. Do you want it? I do. I do. I do. Her tongue came out just like a loyal pet dog, and she began to drool. What is wrong with you two? She's your sister? I slapped the man hard on his right cheek. Oh, so now something is wrong with us? What about you, you skinny freak? What was in your mind when you agreed to go on a movie date with a giant, huh? You're so pathetic that you prey on girls like her, thinking she will fall into your lap because she would have no self-esteem? Isn't that what you thought? Please, let me go, I'll never- It's too late for you now, Mr. Slenderman! I threw the lollipop at Amy and she grabbed it with her teeth. Amy, put him to sleep. I'll check his car for valuables we can sell tomorrow. Three robberies in one week. Not bad. If you keep helping me like this, I promise I'll buy you the biggest fridge in the world and fill it with all your favorite foods. I will help you. I want to help. Amy shifted her burning eyes to the man. The man started to crawl back, screaming for help. No! No, please! Let me go! Please! No! I came back to the red pickup van and made everything mine. The man's scream faded into the dark sky and Amy came back. Her clothes were stained in blood, but her entire attention was on the lollipop. I put my little sister in the passenger seat and left the scooter behind the bush. It was also stolen, so <laughs> no harm. As we drove into the empty highway, Amy asked, Will we go back to the same movie theater tomorrow? I caressed her cheek and nodded yes. I used to work for pest control services in Louisiana. It was a tedious job with an awful chemical to smell 24-7. Once I got a booking from the outskirts, the client complained that she's facing a major cockroach infestation. The pay was good, so I drove to the place. There was a big wooden signboard with the name The Mannequin Farm written on it. That's an odd name for a farm. I rang the doorbell and waited. Minutes went by and no one opened the door. I knocked heavily this time and heard a feeble woman's voice from inside. Coming, dear. An old woman opened the door. Are you from pest control? Yes, ma'am. Come in, dear. I stepped into the house and the immediate smell of bleach and detergent hit me. Damn, no doubt she's having issues. I tried to kill those vermin myself, but it doesn't work. Seems like they need a way more painful death to die. <laughs> you don't say. 
Suddenly, I heard a scratching sound behind a door on my right. That's just my cat. A poor baby must be hungry. I'll feed him later. She took me to her kitchen. I must say the house looked way cleaner than I expected. No dust and no garbage on the floor. It was a little weird to guess that such a tidy place can face pest issues. But then again, she was living on a farm near the woods. So it was possible. I kept my backpack on the kitchen floor and started my job. The old lady stood behind me and watched me work. Every time I turned to her, she gave me a huge grin, flashing her yellow, broken teeth. I started making small talk to avoid the awkward silence. So, you live alone, huh? Yes. I never married. And also, I don't think anyone can live with me. Why do you say that? I'm an artist. It's hard to understand an artist. I kept working, thinking the woman will leave me be, but she didn't. She just stood there and watched creepily. Do you mind if I use your washroom? Down the hall on your right. I crossed the dark hall and entered the bathroom. The light wasn't working. The morning sunlight coming from the window made the bathroom visible. I did my business. I pressed open the garbage can and saw a vicious sight. There was a skinless animal head inside it. Maggots were eating it inside out. I left the bathroom right that moment and straight walked to the main door to leave. I knew I had my keys in my pocket and I was sure to drive away. But after reaching the main door, I tried to twist the doorknob, but it was locked from the inside, probably with a key. The woman was nowhere to be found. That's when I heard the same sound I heard entering the house. The lady said it was her cat scratching the door from the other room. I walked close to it. It was locked too. I crouched down to look through the keyhole. At first, I saw nothing but darkness. And suddenly, I saw an eye looking at me. And immediately, I heard an inaudible cry of words followed by loud banging on the door. Help me. Who is it? Hello? Just then, I felt a strong blow at the back of my head, and I fainted. When I woke up, I could see drops of blood on my white shirt. My eyes took time to adjust to the lights. Suddenly, there were tons of lights. Once my vision cleared, I saw a skinny, tired man with a horrible physique sitting opposite of me. He was tied to a weird-looking chair. The chair was attached to a big platform kind of thing and there was a foul smell all around the room, even though it was crystal clean. Suddenly, the door opened and the old lady entered, but my stomach dropped once I saw her in the light. The lady was holding a wig in her hand, and the makeup was all diluted like she tried to wash it off. It wasn't a she, but a he. It was an old man dressed like a woman. Sorry for the dramatic entrance. You see, I have to work hard to collect my raw material. What? What do you do? Kill and then eat people? I'm not a barbarian. As I said, I'm an artist. Saying this, he walked to me and revolved my chair at the back. What I saw chilled my bones. On the other side of the room stood an exhibition of mannequins. Only, they were made from skins. Every mannequin has the skin of the animal it is representing. Most of them are wild animals. Those you can call my early works. And these three human are my latest creation. So, do you like my work? Their human figures look distraught. The man even used their real eyes and somehow didn't manage to fit them well. So the eyes were halfway hanging on the chin of the mannequin. He walked to the malnourished man and pressed a button on the chair. The chair started to shake violently, and a scary sound came from it. After three minutes, he stopped the chair, and the man was dead. His feeble, weak body couldn't take the pain. I like skinning them without any wounds. <laughs> it's a quite merciful method, you know. He took off the dog leash from his neck and came to put me on it as his next raw material, but I used my brain. It was my only weapon then. I told him I would like to have the sandwich made by my wife before he starts starving me. 
Hmm, fair enough. I'll bring your bag to you. He brought me my bag and I started looking into it. I was unmarried. It was all a lie to buy time from my possible killer. I had to check your bag for a knife or a gun. Hope you don't mind. <laughs> I don't need a knife or a gun, you son of a psycho! I grabbed the most poisonous chemical bottle I could find and splashed the liquid on his face. He screamed and fell to the floor, holding his face. <laughs> it's burning! <laughs> I got up and started running upstairs. I remembered seeing a balcony in the top bedroom. I reached it and jumped straight from the balcony. Once I got into the car, I started the engine. I heard a lock click and the farmhouse's main door opened. As I reversed the car, I could see the man standing on the porch. His half face was melted, yet he watched me with one eye and then waved at me. I never went back to that farm. Hey guys, my name is Trisha. I'm Canadian, but I live in California. I used to be reluctant to leave my country, but nowadays, I prefer to be as far away from it as possible, and I'll tell you why. It all happened one winter night. My husband was in town working late, and I was alone in the middle of some heavy snowfall. The power was out, the entrances and exits were covered in snow, and I had no cell phone signal. Do you know what the worst part of it all was? I wasn't alone. I was trying to light some candles with my cell phone's flashlight as a guide, when suddenly I heard a whistling sound coming from the hallway. I looked out to see what the noise was, and I saw him. It was a terrifying man, tall and scrawny. His face was frighteningly misshapen, and his eyes were shaking. He looked as scared as I was. Maybe he was lost. Hey! Who are you? What are you doing in my house? Sorry. I've been here for a long time, but only now have I dared to come out. What do you want? Go away now! I'm armed. You chose the wrong place to break into. I wasn't armed, but I put my hand in my pocket to make him think I had something. You don't have to get angry. It's too cold to leave. I just want a hug. Can you... can you give it to me? I hate the cold. He walked in my direction, so I backed away a little bit at a time. Are you crazy? Stay back. I told you I'm armed. Ignoring me, he walked quickly to where I was. I ran into the dining room, hiding behind a piece of furniture. I could see underneath, and I could tell he was confused when he arrived. His footsteps began to head toward the stairs, but suddenly, they changed direction and came toward me. I closed my eyes in fear. I froze and cried quietly. The footsteps stopped near me, and when I opened my eyes and looked under the furniture, he was gone. In that moment of panic, I didn't let fear take over. I had to think fast. I rammed the furniture with all my might, and the intruder fell to the ground. I ran as fast as I could to my room while looking back. The man had hit his head, but this didn't seem to affect him, as he kept staring at me as he gathered his strength to get back up. When I got to my room, I locked the door and grabbed a candlestick to defend myself. By the time it occurred to me to cover the entrance with a piece of furniture, it was too late. The man was violently ramming my bedroom door. The blows were of such a violent nature that it didn't seem possible they were even made by the same person, the same person who timidly told me he wanted a hug. The wood of the door gave way and the man entered, with his same shy face and his eyes focused on me. Please. I'm not asking much. Why are you rejecting me? I just want a little hug. Aren't you cold? Ah! With brutal and fearless force, the man grabbed my wrist before I hit him and began to squeeze it. He squeezed it so hard that the candlestick fell to the floor and I fell to my knees in pain. 
Even though I lost my weapon, he kept squeezing harder and harder until with one swift, strong movement, he dislocated it. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to hurt you, but you asked for it. As soon as he finished his justification, the man knelt with me and hugged me. His embrace was very strong. I tried to free myself, but in a matter of seconds, I was losing my strength. I was running out of air. He was squeezing me so hard that I felt like my rib cage was going to explode. I felt that my ribs were starting to give way and my bones were going to explode. I also felt a very distinct pain in my body. It was the man's fingernails. They were very long and sharp, and he was digging them into me as he hugged me. I couldn't scream from the pain because of my shortness of breath, and the man's strength only increased. Suddenly, when I felt like I was going to faint, that my body was going to give up and my spine was going to break in two, salvation came. The light returned to the house, and the radio that I left on so as to not feel alone sounded loudly behind the intruder. In that moment of distraction, I bit him as hard as I could, and he let me go. I wanted to take advantage of this moment to hit him again. I grabbed the candlestick with my left hand and was ready to attack him, but before I did, I saw his face and stopped. His eyes were frozen on me with a huge smile. It was the first time I had ever seen him smile. This man was waiting for me to attack him. He was ready to break my other hand. With the candlestick in my hand, I walked backward. He also stood up and walked toward me. I had only one escape left. I threw the candlestick against the window, breaking the glass and threw myself through it. When I fell, the snow covered part of my fall, but it was so high that I almost drowned and got lost in it. I found my way to the surface and made every effort to run as far as I could. I looked up at the window and saw that the psycho was also diving. Delayed by the snow, I ran as fast as I could. The cold was too much and my body was freezing, but if I had to choose how to die, I preferred to do it this way. I felt weaker and weaker. I wasn't going to be able to go much further, but I knew he wouldn't be able to either. Ah, I'm cold. I don't like it here. Those cries of suffering were my only consolation. The man would die with me. Eventually, I ran out of energy and gave in. My body hurt too much. Was it because of the snow? Because of the hug? I didn't care. I just gave in and let the cold take me. I have to admit that when I woke up in the hospital several days later, I thought it was a dream. Some neighbors had seen me and came out to rescue me. Although my neighbors were doctors, they only saved me from dying of hypothermia, but they could only do so much with my broken bones, so they took me to the hospital as soon as the blizzard lost its strength. After I told the police everything, they searched for the body of my attacker, but he was gone. After that, I could never go back to that house again. My husband understood perfectly and soon after, we moved to the United States. The man who attacked me was insane and he was never found. I don't know when, but I know that at some point that man will strike again. And I don't want to be anywhere close when that day comes. I moved into my new neighborhood a few weeks ago. I thought it was a quiet street with kindly neighbors, something that I don't mind in the least. I wanted a quiet life but something that happened a few days ago has seriously made me consider moving. It all started when I was unpacking my car when my next door neighbor came over to introduce himself. He was a tall, thin man with a squarish face and dark circles under his eyes. His brown hair was already graying and had a streak of white running through it. He seemed friendly enough, but I couldn't help but feel a little uneasy around him. Hello, neighbor. I notice you're new here. You must be Jimmy, right? Yes, I am. How did you know? Oh, I'm on the board for the HOA and we always discuss our newcomers. Welcome to the neighborhood. I live right over there. I turned toward the house he was pointing toward, and the concern must have registered on my face because he began to talk again. 
Oh, sorry about the boarded up windows. I realize they're not that welcoming, but I'm getting some repairs done. Hey, I completely get that. We chatted for a little while more and he eventually invited me to dinner. He said he always invited new members of the HOA to dinner. I accepted his invitation to dinner, but I couldn't help but feel a little nervous. I didn't know this man too well, and I didn't know what to expect. As I finished offloading my car, I glanced over at his house and felt a strange chill run down my spine. My neighbor sat on his porch, his eyes fixed on me as I worked. We made eye contact and he smiled. It seemed friendly enough, but something about it just didn't sit right with me. Still, I decided to go to dinner anyway. He was on the board of the HOA and I needed to make a good impression. When I arrived at his house, he greeted me at the door with a smile. He led me into his living room, which was decorated in a dark and macabre style. There were black curtains drawn over the boarded up windows and the only light came from a few candles on the coffee table. He offered me a seat on the couch and then he went into the kitchen to get dinner ready. I sat there alone, feeling increasingly uncomfortable. I could hear him banging around in the kitchen, but I waited politely for him to return. Finally, he came back into the living room with a plate of cheese and crackers. He set it down in front of me and then sat down across from me. I hope you like chicken. It should be done soon. Until then, here's some snacks. While eating the food, however, I began to feel a little dizzy and my eyes began to close. What? What's going on? I woke up looking around desperately. I felt my head clearing and I began to realize what had just happened. The low brick ceiling prevented me from seeing too far into the dim room, but I did see him. He stood there with a wide grin on his face as he stared at me. Let's play a game, shall we? What are you on about? Let me go! I will let you go, Jimmy. You just have to escape. I'll give you a three minute head start. I wanted to tackle him to the ground, to fight him, but I noticed a long metal shovel in his hand and I thought better of it. Struggling to my feet, I began to run. I still felt a bit dizzy, but I managed to make my way up the stairs, lurching from side to side. One, two, three, four, five. I could hear him counting and it sent chills down my spine. I had to get out of here. Rushing toward the front door, I threw my body against it, but nothing happened. The door was bolted shut, and I already knew that the windows were still boarded up. Damn it! Damn it! I turned around desperately, looking for a way to escape. I could still hear him. Two minutes forty-five. Two minutes forty-six. I stood there, frozen in fear. I could hear his footsteps now, and I knew that he had finished counting. My head was finally clear though, and I forced myself into action. I could see him coming out of the basement as I bolted for the stairs, heading upward. He held the shovel in his hands and ran toward me, a maniac smile on his face. I desperately ran up the stairs, dodging down one of the many hallways in the house. I could still hear him behind me, taunting me. Jimmy, come out! I know where you are! I threw open a door and climbed a flight of stairs. Suddenly, however, I saw the outside. I saw a window that hadn't been boarded up. I threw myself out the window in joy, but froze in my tracks when I realized where I was. I was on the roof of this three-story house, and I could hear him panting up the stairs behind me. Help! Help! Someone help me! The neighbor emerged from the window, his eyes glinting with malice as he approached me. Looks like this is the end, Jimmy! He walked toward me slowly, raising a shovel above his head. I cowered in fear, expecting him to bring it down at any second. Suddenly, however, the neighbor fell. He tripped over a loose shingle, his hands flailing as he tried to grab the roof, but it was of no use. He fell plummeting downward as I bolted for the window. A few hours later, I managed to break out of the house and call the police. You might think this would be a happy ending, but I don't. The police never found his body. Apparently, he fell into one of the bushes around his house and managed to escape. What's worse is that last night, as I was going to bed, I saw something. 
I couldn't make out the face of the shadowy figure standing across the street, but I did see something else. He was holding a shovel. It was one summer morning. I just entered the class and found out our history teacher is on leave. Having a free period is the biggest joy to any student. So my friends and I decided to play basketball in our gym. There were fewer people in the gym that day. Most of them were buried in books or their phones. My friend Marcus passed me the ball and shouted, Go for the basket, now! I also showed my skill and made it happen. My group cheered for me and out of joy, I kind of threw the ball, not caring which way it was going. The ball hit a student sitting on the stand wearing a hoodie. The student didn't say anything, just picked up the ball and threw it back to us. Feeling bad, I went to apologize. Hey, I'm sorry, I, I got carried away, I guess. It's okay. Hi, I'm Chad. I'm Gina. Knowing I'd hit a girl, I got even more embarrassed. Gina had her head down so I couldn't see her face. Yo, Chad, the game isn't over yet, bro. Marcus called out, and I rushed back, saying, Nice to meet you, Gina. I'll see you around then. I went back to the game. Who was that? Some girl named Gina. I feel so bad for hitting her. Is she hot? What? Oh, come on. You know what I mean. She must be new here. Let's talk to her. Marcus has always been a flirt, so he dropped everything and went to talk to Gina. Now, all the other boys gathered around to see what happens. Marcus went to her while she sat in the same way, keeping her head down. I don't exactly know what Marcus said, but guessing his nature, he must have tried his corny pickup lines and then suddenly, Gina stood up and removed her hoodie. Ah! Holy smokes! Marcus backed off, screaming in fear. She smiled eerily at Marcus and asked, You still think I'm beautiful? And then walked away. Whoa, we have a psycho in this school, bro. Don't talk like that, Marcus. Maybe she had an accident. I'm telling you, dude, this girl's creepy as hell. By the time school ended that day, everyone had heard about Gina, the girl with a stitched face. One thing, I was sure that my jerk friends are now going to bully her the most. The next day at school, we were having lunch at the cafeteria when I saw Gina eating alone. I felt a little bad for her and thought to ask her how she was doing. Hey, Gina, right? You're settling okay? She got shocked because she probably didn't expect anyone to come up to her and talk in a friendly manner. Um, yeah. Yes, I'm fine. Hey, yo! Stitch face! Suddenly, Marcus called her names and everyone started laughing at her. Man, she looks like her doctor failed medical school. <laughs> Good one, Talia! I could see Gina's face turning all sad and humiliated. I had to do what I always did. Guys, not funny! Don't pay attention to them, okay? You're beautiful just the way you are. Gina got up and thanked me. She then gave Talia a cold stare and left. What's wrong with you all? No, what's wrong with you? All the girls in school, she's the one who catches your eye? What? Oh, come on, admit it. You feel the need to save her. But I'm telling you, Chad, that girl is bad news. I argued with Talia and went to class. That day, I was feeling really upset to think how mean my friends were. To clear up my mind, I went for a swim. Generally, I do this trick to calm down my nerves. I stay underwater as long as possible and count to see how long I can hold my breath. I was doing the same thing that day as well. The blue, clear water of the pool was over my head. Suddenly, I felt like I was being watched. I lifted my head to look up and almost got a heart attack. It was Gina. She was floating upside down over my head, looking at me without even blinking. Ah! I gasped in fear and ended up choking on water. I jumped out of the pool, coughing horribly. So sorry. I didn't mean to disturb you. I thought you froze underwater, but then realized you're meditating or something like that. It's... it's... it's all right. You kind of, uh, startled me. I... I should... I should take a break. As I saw on the edge of the pool, Gina sat beside me. It's my face, right? I scared you, huh? No, don't say that. I'm not like my friends. I know. 
you're the only one who treats me like a human being here. If you don't mind me asking, were you in some kind of accident? Gina stared at me for an uncomfortable amount of time and then said, Something like that. I'll tell you some other day. I need to go now. She was wearing her dress when Marcus and Talia walked in. What the? Chad, you want to do her? Hey, Stitch Face, how come you're so pathetic? Shut up, you two! Gina, I'm sorry. It's okay. I got it, Chad. Gina walked extremely close to Talia and said in a spine-chilling voice, Maybe I should cut off your face and wear it like a mask. What do you think? Sweats appeared on Talia's face and she replied, You're such a psycho! Get away from me! She pushed Gina into the water and left. I tried to help her, but she swam to the other side and walked out of the pool. I'll never forget the next day of school after that pool incident. We were all in class when suddenly we heard a spine-chilling scream. We all rushed outside and figured out it was coming from the girls' washroom. As we pushed the door open, we witnessed the horror. Talia was lying on the floor upside down, and Gina was sitting right beside her. She had something on her face. Her stitches were covered, and no, it wasn't makeup. Gina was wearing Talia's face instead. She had a paper knife on her hand with stains on it. <laughs> now do you all think I'm beautiful? Tell me, Marcus, am I doable now? Tell me, you sons of witches! <laughs> Talia was sent to the hospital where she failed to survive the attack, and Gina was sent to a mental institution. I haven't seen her since. Hi, I'm Sylvia. A week ago, I had to move to Pittsburgh alone with my dad. My father had landed a job in the city, and so I had no choice but to come with him. I love him a lot since he has taken care of me after my mom died in a car crash when I was young, but moving to a new city during midterm is such a pain. It's not easy for me to make friends in a new city, especially if you're a nerd. My grades got me admission into one of the top school of the city. It was a nice campus, but the kids there were anything but nice. On my first day itself, I got the worst scare of my life. I had just finished class and went to the restroom, and when I went in, the door got locked from outside. I panicked and was trying to open it when the power went off, and I heard a loud, ghostly voice roaring from the other end. I tried to run when I hit my head against something and collapsed. The next thing I know was that I was in the locker room, surrounded by people and the principal of the school. I got up and they asked me what had happened, why I screamed and collapsed in the restroom. I told them what had happened. No one believed me. They thought I had some kind of daydream and asked me to relax and went away. Moments after they left, two girls, Karen and Amelia, came up to me and told me something that shocked me. They told me about Charlie, a psychotic faceless man who roams the town and abducts girls and kills them. I was terrified to hear this, and that night at dinner I told my dad what had happened. Dad dismissed it, saying there's nothing like a faceless man. It's just some stupid urban legend and a bunch of lies. I couldn't sleep well that night. The creature's face kept coming into my mind. I came out to the balcony for some fresh air, and that is when I saw something horrifying. On the street in front of the house, I saw a man in a hooded jacket walking slowly in front of my house. And just before he passed our house, he stopped and looked up at me. I jumped in horror. It was the same faceless man Amelia and Karen had told me. I screamed in fear and ran inside. My dad came to me room and asked me what had happened. When I told him, he immediately went to the balcony to check, but there was no one there. He took me to him room and made me sleep next to him. I was shivering in fear. He consoled me and made me sleep. The next day when I went to school, I saw Amelia and quickly rushed to her to tell her what had happened, but she was lost in thought. When I shook her back to reality, she looked at me and broke down. Hey, Amelia, what happened? 
She was breathing hard and told me, Karen is missing. She went out last night and never came back. I was shocked to hear this and was about to ask something when the cops arrived at our school and wanted to meet us and question us regarding Karen. We told them all that we knew. We told the cops about the faceless creature and they just laughed it off, saying it was just an urban legend. After they left, I told her that I saw the faceless creature again in the night. Amelia had decided to go look for the creature. I told her that it was a bad idea, but she would not listen and left. I was worried for Amelia, and in spite of being scared, decided to help her. We took our cycles, did not tell anybody where we were going, and rode to the edge of town. There was an abandoned tunnel. Amelia told me that the creature lived in this place. We kept our cycle outside and went into the tunnel. I was scared, but Amelia was determined to find her friend. As we went in, the place got darker and darker. Just when we were about to switch on our mobile lights, we heard a scream. Let me go! No! We froze for a second. Amelia's eyes lit up. She told me that it was Karen's voice. We ran inside, but the tunnel split into two paths. We did not know where the sound came from, and we did not want to split and search either. We decided to take the path on the right and started walking inside. A little ahead, we saw a door, but it was locked. Amelia asked me to look for something to break the door open. I was looking for something in the dark when the door suddenly opened. I turned to look, and there he was, Charlie. He had the ugliest face, completely wrinkled and scary. I screamed in fear and froze. He looked very angry and charged towards Amelia. Amelia was trying to fight back, but she was losing. I had to do something. I looked around and found an iron rod. I took it and hit his head hard. He collapsed and fainted. We quickly went in to rescue Karen and called the cops and ran out. The cops came after some time went into the tunnel and came back saying that there was no one inside. We were shocked to hear this. We had proved that the legend was true, but feared that Charlie was still out there and will be looking to take revenge on us. The cops asked us not to leave home for a few days and that they'd put out a notice for Charlie, the faceless man. That night when I was asleep, I heard the window of my room crack open. I looked and was shocked. It was Charlie. He was rushing towards me, saying, I will kill you! I jumped and screamed in fear and tried to rush out, but he grabbed my hand and pulled me. I fell on the bed and yelled out to my dad for help. Just when the door opened and dad came in with a shovel and hit Charlie in the head, we called the cops who came in and arrested Charlie. The town was finally free of that faceless psychopath. Hi, I'm Paris, and last weekend was the strangest weekend of my life. I was blissfully sleeping in the car while my boyfriend Clark was driving. We were headed to this beautiful farmhouse next to a lake. It was our much-needed break after a month-long busy work schedule. I had closed my eyes and was enjoying the breeze when Clark suddenly applied the brakes of the car. I hit my head on the dashboard and woke up with a shock to see Clark closed his eyes in fear. Clark, what the hell? What happened? He opened his eyes and was even more terrified. I kept asking him what happened, but he didn't reply. He just got out of the car in a hurry and went out looking for something. I followed him out and was losing my patience with Clark's behavior. He looked around and said, Where did he go? He was right here. Who are you talking about? There's no one here. He came out of nowhere. I got scared and stopped, but now he's missing. I thought Clark might have dozed off while riding and had a daydream. I told Clark to take a break from driving and I took the wheels. He was still worried and looking around, so I put on the radio and our favorite dance number was playing. I started to massage Clark's neck and told him to relax, and just when he was about to close his eyes, we arrived at the gate of the farmhouse, and what we saw at the gate gave us a shock. There was an old man holding a rifle and waiting for us. I got tense to looking at his rifle and asked him what the rifle is for. He looked at me with his rock-like face and told me, For the wolves. 
I'm Mr. Parker. Welcome to Farmhouse, where time stands still. The farmhouse was exactly like we had imagined. I told Clark to forget about what happened and have fun. Clark and I went inside, and the place and its decor was straight out of a fairy tale. I was happy and rushed to hug Clark, but Mr. Parker walked in between with the luggage and scared the hell out of me. Later in the evening, when we were asleep, I heard a loud gunshot and woke up. I came out to the balcony thinking Mr. Parker might have killed a wolf, but what I saw stunned me. There was a girl in a white flowing frock, like a bride, standing on the terrace with a rifle in her hand. I was both surprised and shocked to see her, because I thought there was no other guests in the farmhouse. I yelled out to her. Hi! She didn't reply. She just went away without even looking at me. I thought it was strange and wanted to find out more about her, so I came out of the room and was headed towards the stairs when someone tapped my shoulder. It was Mr. Parker. Tea is served at the table by the lake. Please come, madam. I saw a girl on the terrace. Is this the way up? That is a private area, madam. Guests are not allowed there. Please leave. I found this whole thing very strange, but I had no choice but to leave. I decided to get back in the night and check. While having tea, I told Clark about the girl. He was about to say something when we saw another girl coming out of the lake and walking towards the house without even drying herself off. We called out to her, but she did not respond, just like the other girl on the terrace. I got very curious now and asked Mr. Parker about the girls. Guest information is confidential. Get ready for hunting. I did not understand what he meant by hunting and asked Mr. Parker. He said it was part of the farm stay experience. We both got excited and a little while later we entered the woods nearby. Mr. Parker was our navigator. He pointed in a direction and Clark took a shot but missed. It was my turn next. Mr. Parker listened carefully and then pointed in a direction. I aimed and took a shot. I heard the shrieking of an animal and rushed to look. But then Mr. Parker took out a Bluetooth speaker from the ground and told us that it was just a simulated game, and we had a good laugh about it. Later that night, Mr. Parker served us some delicious food. I casually asked him that I wanted the recipe, and he looked at me with a cold face and said, It's human meat curry. We were shocked to hear this, but then Mr. Parker burst out into a monstrous laugh and told me that he'll give me the recipe when I leave from here. After dinner, I had decided to find out more about the girls, but the food Mr. Parker served us made us drowsy and put us to sleep in no time. And then suddenly, I heard a gunshot and woke up. I came out of the balcony to the same the girl standing on the terrace, like what happened the previous day. I came out of the room and was going towards the terrace when just like the previous day, Mr. Parker tapped on my shoulder, stopped me from going upstairs, and told me that the tea is served by the lake. I was at the lake having tea when I saw the same girl coming out of the lake and walking away. The same thing was happening again. I tried to explain it to Clark, but then Mr. Parker came and called us for the hunting. At the hunting, Clark missed the first time, and when I took a shot, the animal shrieked in pain, but the Mr. Parker came and showed the Bluetooth speaker. I told Clark that I've lived this day before. Clark strangely did not believe me. At dinner, we ate the same food again. Mr. Parker made the same joke again. I was getting worried, but when I told Clark, he just asked me to rest, and we slept. I was woken up again by the gunshot, came out to see the same girl, and was again stopped at the stairs by Mr. Parker. The same girl came out of the pool. Then we went hunting. I shot, and Mr. Parker got the speaker, and then dinner, and we slept again. But this time, I woke up early and went to the terrace and saw the girl coming out of a room. I walked towards her to find out what was happening, but she tried to shoot me. I ran from there and came to my room, woke up Clark and told him what had happened, and he was shocked. We had to save ourselves, so we sneaked out of the house, started my car, but Mr. Parker was at the gate aiming his rifle at us. I stopped for a moment and then hit the accelerator and drove past him as he tried to shoot at us. We drove away from there, but as we were about to hit the highway, 
we saw the same man who had stopped Clark before. He told us that he was also one of the guests there and was trying to get out. We didn't believe him at first, but he showed us his ID and begged us to help him. We asked him what was going on in that place and he told us that the farmhouse was cursed and whoever came there was stuck in a time loop and couldn't escape. We were lucky enough to get out of there alive and we never returned to that place ever again. I used to work as a caregiver in an old age home. Taking care of old people can be hectic and sad at the same time. Seeing them on their deathbed asking about their families who hardly visit them made my heart ache. My supervisor often told me not to get too attached to the patients as it could hurt in the end, but I guess I've always been a sympathetic person. So, this one time, a new patient named Diane came to our facility. She was suffering from dementia and was already 75 years old. Now every patient, especially the most critical ones, get certain caregivers who are experts in the required field. And this is how I came across Miles. He used to be the senior manager and he maintained quite an odd personality. First of all, he looked very different, not in a way pleasing to the eyes, and other employees kind of stayed away from him. I heard he was very rude and strict with newcomers, as I was the new one joining the team. I was already nervous and when I got appointed to work under Miles, I almost crapped my pants. Before Diane's arrival, Miles called me into his office. May I come in, sir? Don't waste my time, silly! Just come in! I went in. Miles checked me out from head to toe and it gave me the creeps. His widespread eyes made it very weird to maintain eye contact with him. So, you must be the new girl. Yes, sir. Well, at least you're pleasing on the eyes. <laughs> I got the undertone of his statement, but being the new one on the job, I kept quiet. It wasn't anything new to me as a woman, so I ignored it. Miles handed me Diane's medicine chart and briefed me on my duty every day. As far as I realized, he was going to sit in his office and relax and I'd be the one pulling the work of two people. I was getting paid at the end of the day, so I didn't mind it. Diane was very sweet and probably the easiest patient to be with. She had no tantrums as she could barely remember what she wanted. I used to wake her up and then draw her a bath. I fed her and also read stories to her so she could go to sleep. She couldn't remember my name but within a week, she started to recognize my face. One day while I was bathing her, I saw bruises on her wrist. It made me worried as I was sure there was no way she could have done that to herself. I thought to take this matter to Miles before going to the ultimate supervisor. When I entered his office, I saw him sitting close to Rita, another female caregiver and smiling at her very creepily. Me seeing Rita's scared face changed into one of relief and I realized what was happening here. Miles was probably creeping her out as he does with all the girls. What do you want? Can't you knock? I thought it would be a waste of your time. I can see you're pretty busy, but I needed to talk to you about Diane. Miles' face turned red in anger. He didn't expect me to answer him like that. He looked at Rita and then looked at the door. Rita got the hint and like a caged bird being freed. She drifted out of his office in a wink. It better be important or I'll- Diane has bruises on her wrists. I think someone did that to her. Oh, it's nothing. They get annoying occasionally, so we need to straighten them up sometimes. Now my jaw dropped. What do you mean? Stick to your job! Do you understand that? Yes. Fine. I left his office with so many questions on my mind. I knew Miles had something to do with Diane's bruises. Is he the one who gave them to her? That night, I chose to stay back and watch what Miles does during the night shift. Around 9 o'clock, I saw Miles heading into Diane's room. I followed him quietly. The door was slightly open so I could peek in easily. Diane's feeble screams could be heard from the room. No! Stop that! You're hurting me! Please! It's a wave, that's all! Enjoy it! <laughs> Please stop! I'm scared! Diane was lying on her bed and Miles was shaking it pretty violently. 
His eyes widened in cruel joy witnessing the old lady's traumatized behavior. So, this is what he does to the patients when no one's around? What a sick psycho. He then stopped shaking the bed and went to the bathroom. I couldn't see what he was doing in there, but a few seconds later he came back out with the cleaning cloth. He started flicking the cloth on Diane's face while laughing like a maniac. Get it, Granny! This is what you deserve! <laughs> Get it! The cloth he was throwing at her face is used to clean the toilet. My stomach churned in disgust. What kind of person is this? And how come no one has reported him yet? Maybe no one has witnessed him doing this. I slowly took out my phone and started recording. I wanted to stop him and save Diane from what she was going through. But at the same time, I needed to gather evidence to get this guy fired forever. He danced and made vile faces at Diane as she kept on pleading with him to leave her alone. Suddenly, Diane grabbed the tissue box from her bed and threw it at Miles. Even in that stage of her life, the old lady hadn't forgotten how to fight back. Oh, being feisty, huh? I'll teach you the real deal now. Miles grabbed her wrists and started twisting them in the opposite direction. Ouch! Don't do that! Stop it! Stop! Why? I thought you liked it! I've had enough! Please, it hurts! Tears rolled down my eyes. I just wanted to jump in and crush every bone in this freak's body. But recording the video was essential. Otherwise, no one would believe me. Once I had enough recorded, I rushed to the supervisor. I showed him the video and he couldn't believe his eyes. Miles was called immediately to his office and then reported to the police too. At first, he denied all the claims. But of course he did. But then after seeing the video, his face turned pale. Diane's family was informed and they made sure Miles got what he deserved. I still remember the look in his eyes when the cops arrested him and took him away. It was like he was hell-bent on ruining my life and all he needed was the chance. I never heard from or saw him after that, and honestly, I have so much hatred for that freak that it boils my blood to even think about him. I remember it like it was just yesterday. My girlfriend and I just broke up and I needed something to take my mind off her. So, I decided to go to a Hooters bar. Oddly enough, there was one across the street from my apartment, so I went to check it out. Walking quickly to escape the rain, I mistakenly bumped into a huge man in a trench coat and a baseball cap at the bar's entrance. The man had the physique of a grizzly bear and the eyes of a man on death row. I'm so sorry bro, I didn't see you there. I apologized, but he didn't say a word. All I heard was an eerie hiss, and that I noticed his skin was pale and sickly, like a rotting corpse. His body sagged and his face looked like it was held together with staplers. I noticed his nose had fallen off due to our collision, leaving a red, fleshy hole on his face. The strange man bent down and picked up his nose, and then without a word, he walked into the alley. A little shaken, I entered the bar and sat at a table. A beautiful blonde waitress strutted over to me. This lady was quite the looker. She had curves in all the right places. The name's Molly. What can I get you, handsome? She got me a drink and we started talking, or flirting was more like it. I invited her to my apartment and she asked me to return when the bar closed at around 11pm so we could go there together. Later that night, I returned but found no one at the bar. The door was open, so I let myself in. Suddenly, Molly burst through the kitchen door with blood smeared all over her clothes. Please, you gotta help me! Some maniac is after me! He chased me into the kitchen! Without thinking, I quickly ran into the kitchen while she followed from behind. Then, the kitchen door slammed and bolted behind me, and I knew something had gone horribly wrong. Hey, Molly, what's the big idea? Let me out of here! I pounded on the door, but it didn't budge. I could hear Molly's shrill laughter echo from the other side. When it died down, I heard a throaty hissing noise, like an animal suffocating. Gripped with fear, I turned to see the guy I had bumped into earlier. He had a bloody meat cleaver and a kitchen knife in his hand. The nose that fell off was hanging by a thread. Hey, 
Look, buddy, I, I don't want any trouble. Just put the knife down and, and let's talk. Before I could finish, he charged towards me while swinging the meat cleaver. It slashed my wrist and then another cut my shoulder. A clattering noise ran through the kitchen as I broke through some pots and pans, narrowly missing the deep fryer. He rushed again, grabbed me by the neck, and then pinned my back to the stove. The kitchen knife went straight for my eye. It took all the strength I had to hold back his arms. My body writhed as the blade descended closer to my eye. I knew I had to do something quick or I was good as dead. The deep fryer was inches away from me. It sizzled as I caught hold of the container and dunked the hot oil all over the man's head. He shrieked as his face melted into a gooey mess of flesh and bones, but I wasn't done yet. Still on an adrenaline high, I snagged a coffee maker off the counter, tackled the man to the ground, and then hammered away at his face until he stopped moving. So there I was, standing over the man, splotches of blood all over my hands and face. His legs, which twitched for a while, were now still and lifeless. A jolt of pain shot through my arm as the adrenaline wore off. I quickly tore my shirt and wrapped it around the cuts on my arm. I gotta figure a way out of here. My eyes scoured the kitchen as I searched for an exit. To my horror, the man I killed slowly stood to his feet. Then, fleshy barbed tentacles exploded from his mouth, eyes, and ears. He slowly inched towards me. Its spiky tentacles whipped around as he drew nearer. All I could grab hold of was a ladle, but I knew it wouldn't do me any good. I jumped into the cold room. The door creaked as I dragged it shut. The monster pounded and clawed at the cold room door. I moved a few steps away until I stood next to rows of meat hanging in the room. My eyes glazed and my throat ran dry as I noticed it wasn't beef or veal that hung from those rusty hooks, but human bodies, meant to be more precise. Oh God, what the hell's going on? I almost gagged on my vomit, but then I realized there was another problem. I was trapped in the cold room, and if I didn't find a way out fast, I would freeze to death. Frantically, I searched for another exit, but there was none. I became brittle, the cold biting my fingers and toes, and I knew I had little time left. Luckily, I noticed an air vent at the top left corner of the room. I quickly stuck the ladle through the air vent cover and tugged till the grate was out. Then, I squeezed myself into the vent and made my way out of the cold room. As I crawled through the vent, I heard some noise coming from below. I spied through the grate and the staff area and watched as the waitress held down a man covered in blood. Then, they took a slimy tentacle creature from a pickle jar and jammed it down the man's throat. The man gagged and squirmed. His legs kicked in every direction while the waitress laughed. Soon, he was completely under their control. Holy crap! So that's what they wanted to do to me. No way I'm letting that happen. I burst through the other end of the vent and crashed into the bar area. There was a commotion coming from the back room. I rung the front door handle, but it wouldn't budge. There he is! One of the waitresses yelled, and the tentacle-headed man from earlier came after me. I flung myself through the window. Covered in blood and glass, I limped to my apartment and shut the door behind me. I heaved a sigh of relief. Finally, I was safe. Or so I thought. So, are you ready for our date? My eyes almost popped out of their sockets as I saw Molly standing right in my living room. Hi, I'm Maggie. I had just gotten married and was on my way back to our honeymoon with my wonderful and sweet husband, Joseph. We had booked this place by the beach. Joseph loved to drive, so we decided to drive to the place instead of taking a flight. We left in the morning. We're supposed to reach the place by sunset, but suddenly our car broke down and we were stranded in the middle of nowhere. We took out our phones and were trying to make a call, but there was no network. We were wondering what to do. We had to find a ride to the next town so that we could find a garage to get the car repaired, but there was no one in sight. The sun started to go back down and we were getting worried when a car that passed by suddenly stopped and came back near us. 
A gentleman with pale blue eyes and a strange haircut got down and asked us, Hi, I'm Rob. Is everything okay? Joseph told him what had happened, and he smiled and told us that it's already too late, and then he told us about this motel nearby where we could spend the night and figure out what to do in the morning. Joseph looked at me, and I thought it wasn't a bad idea, so we agreed to go with him. We somehow pushed the car to the side of the road, parked it, and left with Rob. Rob took us to this motel, the highway heaven, but honestly, it looked like hell. It was creepy with low lighting and walls that looked straight out of the Victorian era. Rob smiled sheepishly and apologized for the condition of the motel. He told us he was redecorating and hence it did look a bit out of shape. He actually gave the room free of cost and told us that he knew a garage in the next town and would take us there first thing in the morning. We settled down in the room. It was cozy but had an eerie feeling to it. A little while later, there was a knock on the door. It was Rob. He had come to invite us for dinner that he specially made for us. We sat at the dinner table and Rob served the food himself. He had the strangest smile. It was less of a smile, but more of a creepy serial killer. It gave me the chill down my spine, but the dinner he made was so delicious and we were so hungry that we ignored all of that and just ate our food. During dinner, I asked Rob, do you live here alone, Rob? He told me that he was not alone always. He was married once, and this place actually belonged to his wife. I asked him where his wife is, and he suddenly fell silent. He looked at me with a cold stare and then told me that his wife had killed herself when she was pregnant. I felt really sorry for Rob, but later that night, the strangest thing happened. I was woken up by the sounds of chance. It was strange and eerie. I could see light through the bottom of the door, and it was moving. I got scared and woke up Joseph, but by the time he woke up, the sound and light had gone. I tried to tell Joseph, but he wouldn't believe me. I insisted that he go and check. He was irritated, but went and opened the door. There was no one outside. It was all peaceful and quiet. He told me to go back to bed. I couldn't sleep, so Joseph hugged me tight and helped me go to bed. It must have hardly been a couple of hours when we heard a loud banging sound, like someone was using the axe or something like that. We were wondering what was happening when we saw the shadow of a man outside our window. We were shocked beyond belief. It was the shadow of a man lifting his axe and a man pleading for his life. No, 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 please, please don't do this! The man holding the axe gave out a loud laugh and brought the axe down so fast and chopped something off the man. There was a loud thud and the man yelling in pain. We immediately rushed to the front office to tell Rob about this, but he wasn't there. We rung the bell, but there was no answer. I was panicking and told Joseph, oh, Let's get out of here. Now! Joseph told me that it was too late in the night to go anywhere. He saw the phone and picked it up to call the cops, but the phone line was dead. We decided to go and check the room from where the loud noise came. The room was right above our own room. We climbed up to the next floor and there was a long corridor. And we didn't know which room exactly it was, so we decided to check all the rooms. I was right behind Joseph. I was scared and holding on to his hand while he opened the door of one of the rooms. There was no one inside and strangely, there were no beds either. We went through the other rooms and they were empty too. I was getting very scared. Joseph was about to open the door of another room when suddenly it opened and Rob was standing in front of us smiling. Joseph told him about the loud noise we heard, but what I saw when I looked down shook the earth beneath me. Rob was holding the axe in his hand, which was stained in blood. By the time I could show Joseph the axe, Rob smiled and menacingly said, I hate marriages. They are a curse and I will kill everyone who gets married. He lifted his axe to chop us when I pushed him and ran from there. Rob chased us with his axe, all while yelling, I'll kill you! Marriage is a curse! We came down the stairs and ran towards the main door, but it was locked. Joseph was struggling to open it. Rob walked towards us and gave out a menacing laughter when he saw us struggling. I was thinking what to do when I saw something and an idea hit me. 
I bent down and pulled the rug under Rob. He slipped and fell down and let go of the axe. Rob hit his head hard and was struggling to get up. And just then, Joseph broke open the lock and we escaped from that hell of a motel. It was the worst night of my life. I've always loved the Scream movies, ever since I was a kid. I always thought they were a fun concept that everybody took too seriously. But not after what happened a week ago. I'll never watch those movies again. My date and I were headed to the movies. Windows down, music playing loudly. It was a night to remember. I pulled into a parking space and helped Steph out of the car, linking arms as we walked into the theater. We were headed to watch a horror movie. Scream, of course. The lights were dimmed and people had taken their seats. Suddenly, I felt Steph stiffen beside me. I just saw someone in a scream mask lurking behind us. Don't be like that, Steph. You're just getting scared and you want to leave. No, seriously. There's a guy in a scream mask right behind you, Johnny. Turn around. Come on. Forget it, Steph. You're not going to trick me. I can't with you. <laughs> She laughed and seemed to give up on getting me to turn around. As the movie began, however, I couldn't help but turn around a bit, just to see what Steph was talking about. In the top row of the theater was a man wearing a scream outfit and holding a large silver knife. The hairs on the back of my neck stood up as I looked at him. He was looking straight at us and laughing. <laughs> I started laughing as I looked at him. I couldn't help it. <laughs> I turned to Steph and whispered to her. Come on, Steph, that's just a cosplayer. You know, a fan of the movie. A cosplayer? Yeah, it's someone who dresses up as a character they really like. You know, nerd stuff. He's about as dangerous as a D&D &D player. Suddenly, we heard screams coming from the back row. Ah! We both spun around and saw a bloody body lying on the floor. And the man in the scream mask standing right next to it, his knife covered in blood. I jumped out of my seat and grabbed Steph's hand and we ran towards the exit. We reached the door, but it was locked. We shouted for help, but all we heard were screams coming from outside. <coughs> Suddenly, the door opened, but it wasn't someone who had come to help us. It was another man wearing a scream mask. We ran back up the stairs and barricaded ourselves in the projection room. Oh, what's going on? Johnny, what's happening? I don't know, Steph. Just help me put this chair in front of the door. We heard a loud crash followed by several bangs on the door. The man with the knife had broken down the door and was advancing on us. Suddenly, a sharp blade flew through the air and cut Steph's throat open. I screamed and ran to her. Tears streaming from my eyes. No! No, Steph! But before I could do anything, there was another blade coming at me. I dodged it and ran out of the window. I ran out of the theater, ignoring the body strewn over the floor as I did. I had to escape. I jumped in my car and turned the key to start. I drove right to the nearest police station and reported what had happened. The police came to investigate, and when they got there, the theater was empty. All that remained were the bodies of Steph and the other people there. Come with us, son. We have some questions for you. What? For me? What do you want me to say? We just have to make sure you didn't have any motive. You have the right to remain silent. I was taken away, my heart racing as they interrogated me. Eventually, however, they grudgingly let me go and I drove away with relief. Still, I felt a cold, piercing pain in my heart as I thought of Steph. As I was driving home, I realized there was a way to solve this mystery. Security footage. If the killer had been caught on camera, he could finally be brought to justice. Yes, I can get them. I can get revenge. My heart raced with excitement, but that quickly turned to terror as I saw a car with dark windows following me. I stepped on the gas and tried to lose them, and I was almost safe when suddenly I felt a bump behind me. There was no use. They had caught up with me. I crashed the car and tried to make a run for it, but I slipped and fell. As I turned around, I saw another man in a scream mask walking towards me. This is the end, I thought, until out of nowhere a police car appeared. 
Get down! This is the police! The man in the scream mask turned and began to run, but the police were quick. He was immediately tackled and arrested. Apparently, the police thought the killer would want to finish the job. And they were right, I guess. Still, there's something that's been bugging me. And I'm not really sure if I'll ever get over it. The killer they caught was a nasty man. A serial killer who had been inspired by the Scream movies and had been terrorizing movie theaters around the country. Steph and all of those people in the theater are dead because some maniac wanted to live out his own horror movie. And I can't help but feel guilty. I'll never watch a Scream movie again. That's not the only thing that's been bugging me though. And the other thing is even scarier. The police did manage to apprehend the man in the Scream mask, but there were two at the theater. And if the man had wanted to finish the job, then what about the other one? I'm petrified at the thought of them still out there, waiting for their next opportunity. And what if they're still after me, trying to finish the job? I was struggling to free myself from this horrifying situation. I was surrounded by spirits. I begged them to let me go, but they just continued to circle around me, and suddenly, one spirit leaped and entered my body. I screamed in fear, my body shuddered in pain, and I suddenly woke up and looked around. It was the new place I had moved into just a few days back. Hi, I'm Rachel and my life took a turn to the worst after I moved into this new city. I was all excited when I moved in here. A new job and a new place to live, but from the very first night, I was haunted by this nightmare, and it's been repeating almost every night. When I told my friend about it, she suggested that I meet a psychic. I never believed in them, but still agreed. I booked an appointment and got one for next week and had to wait. I cut the call and was having dinner at home and had a lot of wine to drink when I heard someone whispering in my ear. I jumped in fear and the food on my plate fell on the ground and smashed into pieces. I looked around and there was no one. I was scared but had to clean up the mess so I got down to doing it. But just then the power went off, which was very odd and rare. I switched on my mobile torch and started to clean when suddenly someone dragged me out of the kitchen and pushed me out. I hit the floor and fell down. That is the last thing I remember, because when I woke up it was morning and I was on my bed. The kitchen was clean. I was confused if what happened last night was real of dream. Maybe I was high on wine and had a hallucination. I looked at the watch and was getting late for work and rushed into the shower, only to be shocked at what was written on the mirror. Rachel, the truth will liberate you. I got scared and called the cops. The cops came in and asked me all the routine questions and registered my complaint, but just before leaving, said that they were surprised someone had taken this place. I got curious and asked them why they said that, and one of the cops very casually said, a girl was killed here, ma'am. I was shocked to hear this. No one had told me about this when I rented this place. I immediately called the owner and the realtor, but they just brushed it off, saying it was a long time back, and told me not to worry about anything, but I had made up my mind to move out. At office, I asked my colleague if I could stay with her for a while. She happily said yes, and I went home and started to pack my stuff, but... While packing, my mind kept going back to what was written on the mirror. I kept wondering who might have written it, how they knew me, and what truth were they talking about. I asked around the neighborhood about the girl who was killed. Not many knew about her except for one old man who told me that I'll find answers at the Hooters Club. I searched for the club. It was an old place with 90s vibe, but not many knew about this place. I went in and was asking about the girl when there was a tap on my shoulder. It was a girl who hugged me, called me Olivia, and started talking to me like she knew me. I was surprised, and then what shocked me the most was the owner of the place came and told me that I was very brave to have come in after what had happened to Carla. Who is Carla? Who is Olivia? What is going on here? They looked at me strangely when I asked them this. I was about to tell them who I was when a barman came and took me with him. 
I tried to stop him, but he forced me to follow him to the alley behind the club and told me to leave immediately, otherwise I'll be killed if they know that I'd come here. Who are they? Why will they kill me? This is the first time I've ever been here! The barman told me to leave since they were searching for me from the time they came to know that I had killed Carla. I was shocked beyond belief to hear this. I told him I had no idea who Carla was and what was going on here. The barman called a cab for me and ordered me to leave immediately. I came back home all confused and scared. Who were these girls and how was it related to me? I was lost in thought when I felt like someone pushed me and I fell next to my bed and what I saw underneath was the most unexpected thing. There was a wooden box which I had not noticed till then. I opened it was shocked to pictures of a girl who looked like me. I guessed that she was Olivia, who the people at the club knew. There was lots of pictures of Olivia with another girl and behind one of them was a caption, me and Kay getting tanned. I assumed Kay stood for Carla. While looking in the box, one picture fell down and when I saw it, I was completely shaken. It was a picture of my mother holding two kids. I couldn't believe this. I always thought that I was a single child and suddenly I had a twin who was working in a bar and had allegedly killed her best friend. I called my mom and asked her about my sister. She very reluctantly admitted that she had twins and the other girl grew up with her father. They both had sworn never to reveal this to them. This was all unbelievable. I was trying to come to terms with all this information when suddenly I felt like someone lifted me and threw me on the bed and tied me to the bed. I was struggling when I heard a girl's voice. I was waiting for you, sister. I will leave once I'm done here. There was a strong wind and I felt something entering my body. The next thing I know, I was standing outside a farmhouse with a blood-soaked knife and a note in my hand, which read, Thank you for coming. I have been waiting all these years to avenge mine and Carla's death. Could have done this long back, but wanted my twin sister to know about me. Hence, waited for you to come. Thanks. Love, Olivia. I turned to look and was shocked to see a dead man on the couch. I immediately ran from there, never to return to that town again. But I don't like it here. This place gives me the chills, Dad. Oh, just drop it, Andy. It's only for one night. Now go to sleep. Realizing my parents won't leave this motel no matter how much I try to convince them, I came back to my room. If only our car hadn't broken down in this crappy weather, we would have reached Grandma's house by now. I came back to my room and locked the door. <sighs> what the hell? I threw myself on the bed and right that moment I saw something move away outside my window. It wasn't a dream. I definitely saw someone. I walked to my window and looked outside. The rain was still pouring heavily. The light post near the fence illuminated the small pathway leading into the woods. And that's when I saw her. She was so tall, she wore a black tattered gown which rested on the muddy ground. Her hair danced with the wind. Another lightning struck and I heard knocking on my door. Who could be at this hour? I turned back to the window and she was not there. The hair at the back of my neck stood up. Is it her? Is she outside my door now? How will I do? How will I call my parents? I checked my phone and it had no signal. Oh my god, I'm trapped. Oh, Andy. Oh no, she's calling out to me. She's real. Go, go away. But you said I was just a made up story. Are you scared of me now? <laughs> Please, go away. Open the door, open the door. No! She started banging and kicking on the door. I covered my ears and collapsed on the floor crying. I was praying to make her go away. I should have believed the story. Hugging Molly is real. If I hadn't made fun of her, this wouldn't be happening to me. Oh my god, am I gonna die? 
A loud thud broke down the door, and like a tornado, she entered my room. Her head touched the ceiling. Her eyes made me jump. The way she opened her jaw to her chest gave me a heart attack. She raised her claw-like hands and came at me like that. No! Andy? Andy, what happened? I woke up in the back seat of the car hearing my mom's voice. Sweat and fear were all over my face. Hey, did you have a bad dream? I... I thought... This is why I tell you not to watch IMR Scary Tales. Those stories can give you nightmares. I looked around and saw the storm has stopped, but the night is still there. We were parked on a dusty road and a blinking sign written Motel was flashing in red. Come on, let's go in and get some rest. You'll feel better in the morning. Why? Why aren't we stopping, Dad? Andy, it's not safe to drive in such weather. Also, your dad needs to rest. We all need to. Come now. I wiped my face with my sleeves. It was all a bad dream after all. I grabbed my backpack and followed my parents into the motel. Mom, please let me sleep with you guys. I, I can even crash on the couch. Just don't send me to sleep alone. Fine, you can sleep with us. I changed into my pajamas and laid down on the couch. Oh, the washroom is outside in case you need to go. I know it's tough, but just adjust for one night, honey. I was sure that no way I'm stepping outside the room before the sun hits the sky, but life has its way to frack you up. I don't remember what time it was, but I woke up to the loud sound of thunder. The rain had started again. The sudden urge to pee made it impossible to sleep. I'm already sharing the room with my parents, and now I'm about to wet my bed? Damn it, Andy, you're not a chicken. Be a man. I got up and looked outside the window. There was no light post outside. It was all pitch black. I grabbed my phone and turned on the flashlight. I came out of the room taking slow steps. Can't lie, but once I made it outside, that unknown fear clutched me once again. I could see the washroom at the end of the passage. No doubt we're the only ones in this motel. I looked around and made a run for it. Once I got in, I locked the door. I was panting in fear. After finishing my business, I felt a little relieved. All I've got to do now is go back to my room and sleep the night off. I braced myself and opened the bathroom window. As I peeked out, I saw the empty, dark corridor lying ahead of me. Man, that dream spooked me out. I closed the bathroom door behind me and turned around to take my step when I heard a chuckle. <laughs> I slowly turned my head back to the passage and saw something sitting on the floor in a crouched position. It wore a black gown that was tattered in places. What? What are you doing? Whoever was sitting stood up hearing my voice. I have never seen someone so tall before. It was a woman whose long hair dripped rainwater. She had no eyelids, and her mouth was open into a huge jaw. I missed you, Andy. Did you miss me? <laughs> she ran towards me at full speed, and before I could run, she hugged me tightly with her sloppy, clawed hands. She brought her face extremely close to my ears, and talking out her dirty, long tongued scream into my ear. I don't remember anything after that. No, he was never like this before. It all started after we spent the night in that motel, Doc. Please, do something. It isn't normal for a 12-year-old boy to wet his bed every night. He wakes up screaming, and not just that. I don't know how he gets these bruises. Nothing makes sense anymore. <laughs> Calm down, Mrs. Pierce. I know it's tough for parents to witness their child going like this. But I think it's best to consult a psychiatrist now. Rock a by me beyond the treetop. When the wind blows, the cradle will rock. When the bow breaks, the cradle will fall. And down will come, baby, cradle and all. Hello, my name is Maggie, and these may be my last words alive. I'm locked in the dark with a being that is hunting me. 
I may not see him, but I hear his breathing, and I feel his gaze. I'm about to die, and there's nothing I can do about it. The monster is getting closer and closer to me. I can feel it. The only thing I can think about before I die is how this whole nightmare started. That day, I was leaving Carol, my sister's house. I had spent the day with her and her family, but on the way out, something strange happened. A bunch of black vans started to park in the street, and out of them came a bunch of bloody people. One of them ran up to me and knocked me to the ground. He was trying to kill me. Daryl, Carol's husband, pulled the man off of me and started struggling with him. Run! Go check on your family! Thank you. I ran back to my house and everything was terrible. The men were eating all the people around. They were like zombies. I looked in the windows of those vans. No one had gotten out. It was as if they were driving automatically. I ran to my house and slipped away from the zombies and entered my house through the backyard. But something was wrong. The patio door was broken. I ran into the kitchen and found my husband lying on the floor wounded. There was blood everywhere, and next to him was Rick, our neighbor, dead. Maggie, what's going on? Rick went crazy. I, I had no choice. Oh, Glenn, you don't know what's going on out there. Come on, we have to get you to a hospital. You're hurt. As I carried my husband to the garage, I felt something go through my body. It was blood. Glenn was dripping blood from his mouth all over my body. I panicked for a moment and pulled away from him, dropping him. Glenn got up immediately, but something in him had changed. A large amount of blood started coming out of his mouth. His arms began to dislocate, and with every step he took toward me, his legs broke, making strange, inhuman movements. While this was happening, Glenn was still not reacting. He just stared at me as he cried blood, and his eyes swelled up to the point where they looked like they were going to pop out. Suddenly, the man jumped at me. I hid in the car and closed the windows, but I couldn't do it in time. A part of Glenn's body managed to slip out and stretch further and further into the car. He was getting closer and closer to me. My own husband was going to kill me. In one swift move, I waited for Glenn to finish getting in the car so I could close the window and get out. Now, he was the one who was trapped, banging on the windows desperately like a rabid animal. Crying, I went into my house and locked all the doors. After a few months, everything that had happened became clearer. Some scientists revived a zombie frozen for more than 40,000 years. The problem is that instead of using it for good, some nations develop their own zombies and use them as weapons to attack other countries. We never knew who had used it against us, but seeing those black vans, we knew that it was intentional. During these months, most of the zombies, my husband included, had starved to death. But the ones that didn't, they evolved. These zombies were smarter hunters. They knew how to open doors, stalk their prey, and hide. They were lethal predators. One of those days, Carol contacted me asking me to go with her. I had never left my house since then, only to look for food in nearby places. My sister had asked me not to go, but apparently she had changed her mind. I packed my things and left for the night. As expected, several zombies started chasing me. What I didn't expect was that they were so fast. One of them caught up to me as I was jumping over Carol's fence and fell into the garden with me. The zombie was on top of me, ready to bite me until suddenly its head exploded. Carol was behind with a rifle. After she saved my life, my sister told me how trying to defend myself, Daryl had been bitten. That caused him to bite her son as well. Only Carol survived. We spent the night together catching up. We both went upstairs to show me the room I was going to sleep in. But when I went in to check, I couldn't get out. Carol had locked me in. I tried to turn on the lights and they didn't work either. All the windows were boarded up from outside. The darkness was absolute. Worst of all, I wasn't alone. 
I could feel someone breathing nearby. I'm sorry, Maggie. I couldn't let him starve to death. I couldn't find anyone else to sacrifice more than a week ago. Carol? Who is with me? It's my son. I couldn't let him die, zombie or not. I love him. Terrified, I backed into a corner. And this is where I am now. My own nephew is in the dark, waiting for the ideal moment to jump at me and kill me. I can feel him walking around the room, watching my every move. I have a knife in my hand, but I doubt I can use it to save myself. I couldn't see it all and be locked up for so long. I was sure he had already adapted to the darkness. Suddenly, I felt someone run towards me in desperation, and without seeing, I brandished my knife violently and thrust it at something. I had succeeded by a miracle. I stuck a knife in the boy's throat. No! Carol must have had cameras, because as soon as it happened, she came running in my direction. She opened the door and, furious, rushed at me with a huge knife. We were both fighting, trying to kill each other. But suddenly, Carol stopped and smiled. As I looked at her, I realized what was going on. Her zombie son was still alive, eating his own mother's ankle. As I walked away, I could see the child climb over the mother's body that had fallen to the floor and began to devour her organs while she looked at me with a creepy smile and her eyes wide open. Isn't he beautiful? I walked painfully towards the exit of the house. My arm was burning very badly, and as I looked at it, I could see a child's bite on it. It seems that the child got to bite me before I stuck the knife in it. When I got outside, I saw the sun rising while some lights were coming towards us. So they finally decided to bomb us. I sighed as I tossed my cigarette to the ground, stomping it out with my foot. This school looked like a prison, and I was sure I was going to regret coming here. It's not like I had a choice, though, as my parents had essentially forced me to come. All the stealing and gang-related activities I had done just hadn't sat right with them. My dad finally put his foot down after I picked the lock at a rich neighbor's house and stole the man's TV and jewelry to pawn them off at a local store for booze. The tall gate surrounding the building was intimidating, that much was for certain. As I stared at the building, the gates opened and a man walked out. Hello, Dawson, is it? I'm the headmaster. Welcome to our school. Hey, man. You'll address me as sir while you're at this school, Dawson. Yes, sir. Believe me, I wouldn't have addressed him as such, but the man was monstrous with a face that could make you cower in fear. He towered over me, his nose long and hookish, his short hair at the top of his head a dirty blonde. His eyes were cruel, and his face seemed lopsided. The day passed quickly, and I soon found myself in my bunk, trying to get some sleep. Suddenly, I heard screams echoing from the hallway. I froze in fear, knowing I shouldn't go out and investigate, but I had to. I couldn't just sit here and do nothing. Before I could leave the room, however, I felt a hand on my shoulder. You'll get in trouble if you go out there. What do you mean? The headmaster punishes anyone who goes out at night. It's best to just stay in here and try and get some sleep. I stayed put, but the next night the screams came again. I had to investigate this time, so I quietly opened the door and peeked out. The long hallway was empty and I slowly crept along in the direction of the screams. I finally came across a classroom that I was sure the screams were coming from and cautiously slid the door open. The sight that greeted me was terrifying. A shadowy figure was standing on the far side of the room beyond the desks. I couldn't see who he was whipping, but it was clear that he was whipping someone. His hand rose and fell, and the screams echoed in the room. I was about to shut the door again and go back to my bunk, but then the figure turned around and saw me. Ah, what do we have here? You're going to get a punishment for being out after hours. 
I spun around, but I suddenly felt a hand on my shoulder. A teacher stood there, his face contorted with rage. You're gonna get what you deserve. He dragged me into the classroom where the headmaster was waiting for me. You will be punished for being here, Dawson. You shouldn't have snuck out of bed. What the heck are you gonna do to me? He grabbed me by the arm and dragged me out of the room. He took me to a janitor's closet and locked me in, leaving me to sit and contemplate my fate. I'll be back for you soon, boy. When I am, you're going to wish you had stayed in bed. I was left there for what felt like hours. Finally, I remembered my lockpicking skills and managed to pick the lock on the door. I quietly escaped and made my way out of the building, jumping over the gates and running into the woods. It wasn't a moment too soon. I heard a frightening noise and commotion at the school, and I could hear teachers running and cursing with flashlights as they desperately tried to find me. I kept running, never looking back. Dodging through brushes and tall grass, I managed to make it to the highway. Catching the first ride I could find, I hitchhiked my way back to my parents' house. I told them everything. I begged them to let me stay. Oh, I guess we can. Right, honey? You won't go back to doing criminal things? I won't. I promise, I won't. At that moment, however, there was a knock at the door. My father stood and opened it. No sooner had he had opened the door than the headmaster walked in. You're not leaving this school, Dawson. You have to come back with us right now. My parents argued with the headmaster, and soon enough they managed to break the contract and sent me away, safe from the school's grasp. Or so I thought. A few days later, a van pulled up alongside me as I was walking to school. Several men in masks hopped out, holding bats and clubs. I ran as fast as I could, and luckily, they didn't catch me. Get back here, you little brat! But I didn't. As I looked back, I wondered how long I had until they would come back for me. How long could I stay away from that school and the headmaster? How long until I had to face those monsters again? I don't know how much longer I have. I don't think the headmaster wants me to be able to tell anyone about what I experienced at this school. I didn't move beneath the covers, excitement coursing through my veins. The house was silent, and I knew that it was time. I slowly descended the stairs, careful not to make any noise and tip off my parents. I clutched tightly to the railing, afraid of what I might find. I reached the bottom of the stairs, my heart pounding in my chest. I would finally catch Santa. This year, I'd catch him putting presents underneath the tree. I just had to wait till I heard him, and then I'd spring out and catch him in the act. I waited, the silence around me growing louder with each second. Finally, however, I heard some noises from behind the corner. Excited, I sprang out from behind the corner. I gotcha! I... But my voice trailed off. Standing near the Christmas tree was something that horrified me. Something that wasn't Santa. It was a tall, dark figure with pointed horns and a long whip. It turned towards me, its feet goat hooves and its face contorted into a sneer. Hello, Ryan. I screamed and ran back upstairs, jumping in bed and pulling the covers over my head. I stayed like that for what felt like hours until I decided to get up again. I crept back downstairs, my legs trembling as I went and peered around the corner. There was nothing there. I couldn't help but feel relieved. Maybe I had been dreaming and had never left my bed. The next morning, I had all but forgotten about the mysterious creature that stood in front of the tree. It was Christmas, and I eagerly opened my presents. There was a bike, a few new games, and strangely enough, a strange-looking toy that resembled a fidget spinner. A few days passed, and I decided to keep the fidget spinner with me as I made my way to school, despite the strange looks my parents had given each other when I opened it. School passed uneventfully, and I began to make my way home. I walked home, talking to my friends as I did. I swear, it was the craziest dream I ever had. A monster in the house on Christmas? Come on, man. 
Yeah, you must have been dreaming. Have you ever heard of Krampus before? Krampus? What's that? It's some crazy anti-Santa urban legend. You must have seen it somewhere. We continued walking until I saw something out of the corner of my eye. I stopped and strained to look in the direction I had seen it, but whatever it was had already gone. Still, I felt chills run down my spine. Whatever I had seen looked like it had horns, and I thought it looked awfully similar to what I had seen on Christmas. Suddenly, it began to snow incredibly hard. The clouds were so thick that we couldn't see anything in the distance. We ran towards the closest gas station, desperate to get out of the snow. Come on, man, keep up! I shouted behind my shoulder as I ran. When I didn't hear a response, however, I turned around. My friend was gone, and the snow whirled around me harder. What's going on? I kept running, my heart thumping in my chest, until I finally reached the gas station. For a moment, I felt relieved. The sign said the employee would be back in an hour, so I had time to take shelter from the snow and help myself to some snacks. I made my way to the racks of candy and snacks, almost too excited. Free candy for me, I guess. That stupid employee shouldn't have left the store unattended. I began to stuff the candy in my pockets, feeling overjoyed. But then, the lights went out and I heard hooves on the ground. I froze in fear and looked up. Standing before me was Krampus. He sneered at me. You're not on the good list. I screamed and ran as fast as I could, Krampus's hooves thumping behind me as I ran. The snow was coming down harder and harder, making it difficult to see and almost impossible to run. I could hear Krampus's voice behind me, telling me I was in trouble. Faced with no other option, I finally stopped and fell to the ground crying. Above me, a large, shadowy figure appeared, but then I heard police sirens in the distance. With a surge of hope, I ran towards them and right into a group of policemen. Help me! Help me! Krampus is chasing me! Hold on, kid. What are you talking about? Krampus is chasing me! He's been chasing me since Christmas! He was in the gas station back there! See? I, I don't think he liked me stealing candy from the- I froze, realizing what I had said to the police. They looked down at me, sneering. Oh, something really freaked you out. Otherwise, you wouldn't have let slip that you stole some snacks, would you? Empty your pockets, kid. As I sat in a cell waiting for my fate to be decided, I heard devilish laughter from outside the jail. I leapt up, running to a single window in the cell. Outside in the snow, I saw the hulking figure of Krampus. His face was parted into an evil grin. Better be good next year, Ryan, or else there won't be a next year to look forward to. And with that, Krampus turned and vanished into the snow. I shuddered. I'm never going to steal or misbehave ever again. I know that Krampus is supposed to just scare kids, but after a close encounter with him, I can't help but feel like that's just an urban legend. The real Krampus looked all too willing to make sure I stay in line and kill me if I don't. Hi, my name is Mike and I was returning to my hometown after many years and was very excited to see the places where I had spent my childhood days. I reached the entrance of the town, got out of my car and was about to take some pictures when suddenly an ugly looking dog attacked me. I got so scared that I ran back to my car, locked the doors, and drove away into town. I was still shivering with fear when I entered the town to which was eerily empty. At the corner of the street, I saw a pub and went there, and found a couple of guys sitting and having a conversation. I sat at the counter and ordered a beer. I asked the barman, Hey, how come the town is so quiet? The barman did not say anything. And just then, a beautiful woman came and sat next to me. I was happy to see someone that I offered to buy her a beer. I told her that this was my hometown and was looking forward to having a tour of it, but something was bothering her. She kept looking at the watch and suddenly got up and said, I've got to go. Sorry. Please, get out of here. I was surprised to hear this. What was going on here? 
It was too late and I was very tired to leave, so I decided to stay back, which turned out to be the worst decision of my life. I asked the barman for a hotel and he gave me a few suggestions. I went to one of them and asked the manager for a room. I came to my room, showered, and was about to hit the bed when there was a knock on the door. I opened it and was shocked. It was one of the guys I had seen in the bar. He looked like a dead body walking straight out of a zombie movie. He jumped on me and started to beat me up. I was struggling to defend myself, but he held my neck and started to strangle me. I was getting breathless and thought I was going to die, when suddenly he stopped. I turned to look and was even more shocked when his head fell off his body and rolled on the ground. His body then slumped to the ground and behind him, I saw the same girl I had seen in the bar. She had a machete in her hand which was soaked in blood. She quickly walked towards me and said, Hi, I'm Sarah. Come with me if you want to live. I was still in shock when she grabbed me and jolted my body. I came back to reality while she was saying, Hurry! We don't have time, let's go! I tried to grab my suitcase when Sarah told me to leave everything since there's no time. She just grabbed my hand and took me out and we were rushing towards the entrance when suddenly some guys who had turned into zombies stood at the front gate. Know how to slash bodies? I shook my head saying no, but it was too late. The zombies guarding the door leapt on us. Sarah took out a rifle from her back and started shooting them. I panicked and was randomly slashing in the air trying to stop them from attacking me. Sarah shot most of them down and we rushed out of the place. Sarah had a mini truck. I sat inside and we drove away. I had so many questions running in my mind and Sarah knew it. And even before I could ask her, she said, There was some kind of virus infestation some days back that has turned everyone into zombies. But everything was fine when I arrived here just a few hours back. Sarah told me that the infection is spreading really fast and is taking over the whole town. She also told me that I was safe with her and was taking me to a safe place when we heard a loud thud on the roof of the car. Someone had jumped on the car. Sarah lost control of the car. The car hit the curb, leaped into the air, turned and landed on the roof. The impact was so severe that it made me had a blackout, and a little while later when I woke up, I was shocked to see that Sarah was missing. I somehow got out of the car to see that Sarah was surrounded by some zombies and she was fighting them off. I saw the machete on the ground, picked it up, and slashed the zombies that were attacking us. We somehow managed to slash all of them and ran from there. We came to Sarah's house and I suddenly remembered that I had forgotten to take my phone from the hotel, so I immediately rushed to the phone, but it was dead. Sarah told me that the network has been down for the last couple of days, and hence, they have not been able to contact the authorities. I asked her how she managed to protect herself from the infection, and that is when she told me something that stunned me. I'm infected too. I've 24 hours before I become one of them. Then why did you bring me here? To kill me next? Sarah then told me about her eight-year-old son, Andy. She told me that he is safe and has no infections. She got me there so that she could hand him over to me and ask me to get him out of the city. She begged me to help her, and when I saw Andy's innocent face, I knew Sarah was telling the truth, so I decided to help. We took Andy and hit the road, and just when we were reaching the town exit, there was a huge traffic jam of people leaving the town. I was trying to figure out how to get out when I saw that Sarah had turned into a zombie and attacked me and Andy. I took Andy, got out of the car, and ran, but Sarah caught us, and I had no option but to shoot her down and get myself and Andy out of there. I shot her and ran towards the exit. And just then, I saw some fighter jets drop bombs on the town. The explosion destroyed the entire town, saving us. I was so thankful to Sarah who saved me from this hell, which I'll never return to.